Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. Are you all well? Good to see you. Welcome, welcome. We would like to welcome you formally uh, to this very special McLaren Old Boys and Girls Reunion Dinner. We're both fortunate to know a great many of you, which is why it's incredibly difficult to get everybody seated in an orderly fashion. However, it is an enormous privilege to have you all here this evening. Um, I would especially like to thank our overseas guests. You've made remarkable efforts to be here. We have guests from Australia, New Zealand, South America, Japan. It goes on and on. We really, really have, uh, we have 336 of us, I believe, here this evening celebrating. So without any further ado from me, I would just like to hand you over to somebody I've probably got to know best than my own wife in the last 12 months. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Matthew Jeffries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> wow. Thank you, Richard. Look at all the McLaren family we've got together today. It's amazing to see you all. Thank you. This event has been a year in the making, as Richard said, and we're absolutely delighted that Ron accepted our invitation to be guest of honour. So thank you very much, Ron. Now, it strikes me that back in the day, not everybody here saw eye to eye. <laughs> but I think it's true to say that, just as in the words of the great Samuel Goldwyn of Metro, or MGM fame rather, we've all passed a lot of water since then. <laughs> just let that sink in a minute. <laughs> but I think it's a testament to the great name of McLaren that we, all, that we all wanted to be together today. So please, enjoy your evening. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I will just ask you just to, um, I know it's difficult on evenings like this when we see so many friends that we haven't seen for so long, but we're truly delighted to benefit, as I just said, from a capacity attendance. You please excuse me referring to my script. Normally, I wouldn't do it, but there's a lot of script this evening, so please sit back, enjoy your evening. After dinner, we will have the privilege of inviting a number of people who have really been those who have achieved remarkable things in the history of McLaren. It's so difficult to put a list together, so many people. But before that, I really would like to reiterate uh, what Matthew just said. It's an enormous pleasure that we welcome Ron and Carol here this evening, because quite frankly, I'm sure you'll all agree that this evening would not have been the same had it not been for Ron's attendance, because since 1981, he was the man who tirely guided, tirelessly guided McLaren through remarkable periods of success. And I don't mean to embarrass him, but he set benchmarks that every other team simply tried to follow and couldn't. And then, of course, with the announcement of the road car division, that set new standards again. And quite frankly, other people just followed in the wake of what he achieved for McLaren. We sincerely thank you, Ron, for accepting our invitation to join us. And we very, very much look forward to you joining us towards the end of the evening on the stage. And just one note about photography and video. You'll notice throughout dinner, there are an enormous amount of images appearing and there will be video later that I know you will enjoy. Um, I would ask you please not to photograph or film the screens because Matthew and I have lent on countless people to provide us materials of which the copyrights are <laughs> somewhat, uh, shall we say, sensitive. And therefore, if we, could, if we could literally just enjoy the evening, we are going to be officially photographing the evening. We are going to use some of the film footage that's being recorded as we speak up here. And there will be a non-commercial video available. If anybody doesn't want to be in it, please let me know before it gets edited. <laughs> That's really all I have to say until about quarter past nine. Ladies and gentlemen, please enjoy your dinner. This part of the evening proved to be incredibly popular when we held the 50th celebration down near Goodwood 
a different type of event. Again, wonderful people there. Uh, Bruce's widow came along to that particular event and amazing McLaren people like Peter Stainer, sadly no longer with us. Peter joined and looked after Amanda. I said to him, why are you looking after Amanda? And he said to me, McLaren has to look after Amanda. So I said, fine, that's absolutely fine. Anyway, clearly 60 years, it's a momentous achievement for any company, let alone one that operates in Formula One and the competitive, ultra competitive world of Formula One and the automotive industry. For McLaren, it's been the most incredible journey from that very tiny workshop of Bruce McLaren Motor Racing Limited through to the incredible facilities of the Norman Foster Design McLaren Technology Centre, which of course was the brainchild of our guest of honour this evening, Ron Dennis. A remarkable facility and one that some of us are being very fortunate to visit this coming Friday, which uh, I know there was a draw, so many of you wanted to go to the centre that we had to do a draw for it, and those names, Matthew, I know has already been in touch with everybody who uh, was lucky enough to be drawn, so we look forward to seeing you there. Um, throughout the 60 years of McLaren's incredible journey, there have been numerous records set, and Bruce would, I'm sure, be hugely, hugely proud of what all of us have achieved. Matthew talked about us as a family, never a truer sentence. And it's fair to say that the dreams and aspirations of Bruce live on in this 60th year through a team that still sets incredibly high standards. We're indeed very fortunate to have Amanda McLaren, Bruce's daughter, with us here this evening. Welcome, Amanda, and I would ask you all to show your appreciation to her being here with us. Thank you. I think it goes without saying, Bruce, and you see some of these pictures that have been scrolling while we've been enjoying dinner. Remarkable early days. There were lots of other legendary people in those early days too, um, and as if Amanda's presence wasn't enough, we also have Adele Holm here, who is Dennis' daughter. We have uh, Chris, Alex Amon, who is Chris Amon's son. We have Jason Courage, who is Piers Courage's son. And of course, never one to miss a party, and we're really grateful he's here. Just had a great chat with him. Freddie Hunt is here, James's son. So, guys, great to see you as well. Welcome. <laughs> Please bear with me, and then we'll get on to some far more interesting people than me. Uh, the McLaren decades have seen many groundbreaking technologies and innovations and times of great elation for all of us, I'm certain, and the memories and the conversations that many of us were already having this evening, and some of the stories you're about to hear will jog thoughts and memories for us all. Our thoughts are those uh, with those that cannot be with us this evening. Some simply couldn't make the journey, others, a couple of people, not well enough. But I'm sure you'll agree that we also have to think about those who are no longer with us. We, we've lost a number of the family in recent years, and I'm sure you'll agree we hold dear their memories, we value their contributions to what they did for the team, and we also value the times that we all shared together. So a thought as we move forward this evening for those who sadly can't be with us any longer. To get our evening underway, we should perhaps turn the clock back to when Bruce McLaren Motor Racing Limited was a fledgling organisation. And to do that, I'm going to ask three people to join us on the stage to share some memories with us. And they are, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, former... McLaren driver and indeed the number three employee of Bruce McLaren Motor Racing, a man who was responsible for painting cars and helmets to a level that defies you know, detail. And thirdly, a lady whose job was the team secretary. Will you please welcome Helden Ganley, Doug Eyre and Susie Dunbar. <laughs> Helden. Welcome. Nice to see you, Alden. Susie, how are you? I'm fine. Nice thank to see you. you. Lovely to see you. Doug, Hi. how are you? Very well, thank you. Good. Please face our audience and I'll pass this microphone over to you. Firstly, you, Howden. Yes. There you were, number three yes. employee of Bruce McLaren Motor Racing. Those early days, what were they like? Well, it was quite amazing. Um, you know, people ask you, are you good or are you lucky? I was lucky. One day, Bruce McLaren called me up and he said, I'm expanding my team and I only want to employ New Zealanders. Will you come and work for me? <laughs> and so at that stage, I knew about next to nothing. And um, I went down into this workshop. I couldn't believe what it was. It was not much bigger than a stage and had a dirt floor and had a bench and a vice and some welding bottles. It was an old construction site, wasn't it? It, it, it was diggers mostly and things. It was full of bulldozers. Yeah, yeah. We yeah. had a back corner. Yeah. Um, so it was pretty basic, I think. Um, I can't imagine, you know, the difference 
for MTC to there. <laughs> it's unreal, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those early days, obviously, they were more of a passion. They certainly didn't provide a living, did they? Oh, I got, I got paid £12 a week. So, Good Lord. You know, it was a fortune in those days. I'm going to say. And, um, yeah, but it was a very upward-moving company, um, I would mm. say to people. At the end of 64, we built the first McLaren, the M1, mm. and 18 months later, we were at Monaco with the first Formula One car. So, from a sports car to a Formula, to Formula One car. One. Yeah, yeah. A remarkable and achievement. Bruce, Bruce was the most fantastic guy in the world. Greatest leader of men I've ever met in my life. Really? Yeah. We, we should perhaps talk about, I'm going to ask Doug a question here, we should perhaps talk about another man. Doug, you're renowned for being one of the great sign writers, I guess, if I can use that expression. You were there sign writing, that was correct. Um, you got a phone call, didn't you, from, uh, from Teddy. Let me pass the microphone across, just hold it quite close to you, please. Okay, yes. Um, yes, I, I did know the uh, McLaren team. I had uh, actually worked for some smaller teams, and... Uh, it was pretty precious. Uh, I, I worked pretty hard and I'd had a hard week and uh, I was relaxing with my family on a Sunday evening at about nine o'clock. The phone rang. So I picked up the phone and the voice said, uh, I'm, uh, and with an American accent, he said, I'm Teddy Mayer. I'm the managing director of the Bruce McLaren Formula One team, racing team. And I thought, well, that sounds interesting. He said, uh, yeah, somebody's told us that you could put some artwork on a couple of racing cars we've got. And I foolishly said, when would you like it done? <laughs> he said, how far are you from Colnebrook? I said, well, not too far from Colnebrook. How long would it take you to get to Colnebrook? I said, probably about 20 minutes. He's good. He said, I'll see you in 20 minutes. <laughs> and put the phone down. <laughs> To be, to be fair, Doug, I mean, you've also, you painted many transports, you know, the wire cars that went to Le Mans, you did the transporters for them, and you and I were talking the other day, helmet painting for you, and I believe I'm right in saying, probably my research, you said to me the other day, I'm not sure, but I think you've done over 500 helmets in your career, and you were actually compared to Sid in Brazil, who's the other famous helmet painter. You were very particular about the way you painted them, weren't you? Yes. Yes, I... I when I, when I uh, stopped doing the cars, and, uh, and that was probably around about 75, um, I noticed that uh, in Europe, most of the drivers ran around in white helmets. And they didn't in other countries, but certainly in Europe. So having uh, stopped the cars, I thought, well, I better pay a couple of bills. So I put an advert in Autosport and, uh, for somewhere where drivers could come and have a, a design produced exactly for themselves as, a, as a, an identification thing, thinking it might go on for a couple, pay a couple of bills. The phone didn't stop ringing and it went on for 20 years. <laughs> and I, I did paint a lot of helmets. A lot of them I've seen in the cars. It's been nice to see the photographs coming up around the screens. And uh, although I wasn't a, a, an engineer, but I did appreciate uh, the um, the, the work they did and, and the beautiful machines they, they made. And they were always playing colours, of course, so I changed that. Uh, and I enjoyed every minute no. of it. And I thought McLaren's were the greatest. I'd never seen anything quite like their workshops. And this was Colnebrook. And, uh, well, I, I was hooked on it. And uh, uh, that, that day with Teddy Mayer, when I did go there and, uh, and there I saw two Can-Am cars sitting in the middle of the workshop, they looked beautiful. And uh, Teddy Mayer said, yeah, okay, well, they've got to go on a plane tomorrow. <laughs> Seriously. So I didn't get back home until halfway through the next day. I don't think my first wife um, ever really believed that story, I think. <laughs> uh, and, uh, I, and, I, 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 and that happened, I think, with many McLaren people. In fact, one uh, McLaren chap is here... I don't know whether I should mention his name, but one morning I was in and he arrived with his bed on the top of his car <laughs> and his personal belongings inside the car. And that's, that was motor racing you know, in those days. Absolutely. Thank you, Doug, for those memories. Can you pass the microphone? Thank you. 
this lovely lady, Susie Dunbar, probably was better known to many of you as Susie Winslade, I think, in That's those days. That's right. When you were uh, team secretary to Bruce, Denny and Teddy. Some and Phil and occasionally Tyler. He didn't write very many, many letters, though. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Describe those early days as a secretary, Susie. Well, it was my dream job. I started working for the British Racing Sports Car Club, Phoenix Syrett, got fed up with being at Brands Hatch at 7 in the morning and wrote to all the teams. And I'd met several of the team managers and that because in those days you had to check in at the paddock office. And I had a letter back from Phil Kerr who said he was just leaving uh, Brabham's and he was going to McLaren's. Would I like to go and work there? I had no CV, no formal interview, nothing. And it's, it was, I would say, life's very different now, but it, it was my dream job because I'd always loved motor racing. And Howden said Bruce, an amazing guy. You, you knew Bruce, Denny, and obviously Teddy well. I mean, just a quick resume of each one of them, if you would. Um, there's an old story about Bruce and Denny could go into a workshop on one night and say, guys, we're, off to, we're going to go across the Sahara tomorrow. And everybody would say, OK, what time do you want us? What do we pack? This is the type of people they both were. With Denny, if you broke down in the desert or somewhere, you were very pleased he was on your side. Um, and Bruce was just inspirational. He was a very kind, genuine person who was very much tied up in um, his designs. I'd be sitting down waiting to dictate, for him to dictate a letter to me, and suddenly he'd start drawing on the side of a pad. And I'd go, <coughs> I'm still here. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And, and um, you know, we, we'd continue again. But he did that all the time if you went out to dinner. He did on airplanes, apparently, and you probably can s signify this, sketches on the sides of serviettes. But very genuine. It's so different. Now, when I left there at the end of 73, I think we totaled 70 people, members of staff. And I found an a, um, article in LAT a little while ago, which was 1969, I think, and the staff totaled 32. And we were running Formula One, Indy, and Can-Am. Wow. Um, obviously, there was an engine shop in America, but that was the total of the staff. Yes, yeah. And That's Denny? That's why we were a family. What was Denny like? The big bear? Yeah. I've been talking to his daughter, Adele, tonight. He was just a great person. Um, mm. Genuine, calm, and a really, really good friend. You mm. could actually talk to him, and he'd put the world right if you were upset about something. And being a small team and only about 30, 40 employees, everybody knew what everyone else was up to. They soon knew if your boyfriend had upset you and he'd sit you down and tell us all about it, what's going on. And I have to quickly say, I remember Doug, going back to Doug, I remember you saying about the helmets, and the worst helmet you did was Jackie Stewart and the Tartan. You used to hate doing that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you always said that was the hardest one to do. story about that, too. Yeah. So, great days. Wonderful days. Wonderful days. Yeah. Thank you very much for those thoughts from all three of you. Thank you for giving Let me take the microphone off. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Howden Gandhi, Doug Eyre, and Susie Dunbar. <laughs> McLaren, of course, had a hugely successful involvement in both IndyCar and Can-Am, as uh, Susie was just talking about. Let's be honest, even today, when a Can-Am car roars into life or you watch the Indy 500, that's some of that historical footage, it just leaves you absolutely speechless. And I hope our next two guests are not going to be speechless because we've, we've had a bit of a chat over the phone, obviously, in recent days. Um, I'm sure all of you are going to welcome to the stage Huey Absalom and Alec Greaves. <laughs> if I said to you, black masking tape, would that mean anything? Yes. Um, I was in the back of the truck looking for something one day. This was at Mossport. And uh, Bruce come in and said, uh, I need some black tape. I says, what do you need that for? He says, I've got something to do. He says, I said, well, how's that big? He says, oh, like an inch square. I said, what's it for? He said, well, there's a light on in the red, in the red car. It just comes on, it's the oil light. And he said, no, Emmy. So he put the black tape over it. <laughs> <laughs> Turning to your good self, sir, IndyCast, amazing. What, what was McLaren's impact? when it first got into the IndyCar program? How was it received? The first year we went there wasn't that good. Uh, mm. But then 71, we just turned the place upside down, really. Mm. Um, first time we had wings, and everybody copied us from there on, really. Just give us an insight, though, in those early days, because quite clearly, you know, McLaren had gone across the pond. It was there, New Zealand 
New Zealander running the team. How, how was it received by the American racing establishment when you went there? It was probably, they were probably more surprised than anything. Mm. That we just turned up and all of a sudden we were like nine miles an hour quicker than anybody else. Mm. Mm. So, you know, we just kind of turned them upside down, really. Yeah, you make it sound very simple. Yeah, but like when it, it was simple in those days. Yeah, yeah, yeah but there again, MP44 <laughs> turned up, you know, and suddenly turned the world on its head. I know. But uh, going on to Can-Am, just talking about that, Alec, you and I talked a lot about Can-Am when we were on the phone the other day. I'll, I'll pass you the microphone if you just hold it up to yourself rather than step across the front of Huey. You see a Can-Am car today and you look at them, they were very, very raw, and you were actually Bruce's mechanic, weren't you, on one of the Can-Am cars yes, there? Was Just give us an insight to what that was like working with him. Just keep your microphone up. Working with Bruce was amazing. A little bit higher, if you oh, would. Oh, sorry. Working with Bruce was amazing. But I also, I was just a newbie on the car, mm. and uh, it was Alan McCall who started on it, and then I worked with Tyler. Mm. That was interesting. <laughs> to, to say the least. Yeah. Would you like to expand I, on that? Well, he's my mentor more than anything. Because mm. I didn't know too much about them, but after a while you got to know every last bit of it from one end to the other. Mm -hmm. And it was just like working on a... <clears throat> pulling a pin on a hand grenade. You pull the pin out and you never know what was going to happen next. Mm. You just kept at it until it... It was just amazing. Yeah. Everybody yeah. said, how do we keep it going for 200 miles? A lot of luck. That's all it was. <laughs> But, but you're both involved, aren't you, in still restoring some of these cars from that era? I know we, you and I were talking mm -hmm. about this the other day, and also, same with you, Hugh, you've been involved very much with uh, McLaren Heritage on bringing those cars. When, when younger mechanics, younger staff see those cars today, what's the impact of them on the younger people? Um, they just look and they, they, they just look at it and they think, you know, where do you start? Mm. You say you start, but it's when to build one, it's in the rack. Mm. And then they give you, you know, like Gordon, they give us some drawings. And off we go. It's yeah, like like Huey, let me just get the microphone yeah. for it's you like, there, sorry. It's like a reverse in awe, you know. When we look at modern day cars, oh, yeah. That's you think, oh, wow. Because um, I got involved in helping to uh, redo a 1970 Indy car with the Heritage tire guys. And one day they said, oh, well, we need to get the electrician down here to do all the wiring. So I assume. Formula One cars today probably have five, ten miles of wiring, and we had one four-foot piece of wire, and that was it. Yeah. I said, oh, thank you very much. Do they find that amazing when they come over yeah, and look yeah. at the cars? Because obviously one yeah. side you've got the modern cars, and now you're doing the older stuff. It's incredible. Yeah, with the Chevy, you just... Sorry, Alec, just put your microphone up. With the Chevy, you just pulled the wire, and it stopped. You put it back on the coil, and it went again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was it. A simpler form of racing all round. Yeah. But nonetheless. Just, as you say, the ignition was the pin that you pulled. Incredible and days, weren't they? Oh, yeah. And yeah. it was fun to do it. And you're still working on cars now, aren't you? You've got yep. three, I believe, in the I've workshop got three at the moment? Restoring at the moment. What are you working on? I'm working on uh, Donahue's uh, 1970 IndyCar. Yeah. And the one he won um, Pocono with. Yeah. Working on a, an Eagle for Bobby Rahal. Mm hmm. And a. An EMSA car mm -hmm. with a plastic engine with a poly motor yes. in it, which was trying to get to run. Yeah. And that's up at the PAPS people up in Wisconsin because they live in America now, so I work and everything. And I'm still going and I'm not going to stop. Good lad, that's what we like to hear. <laughs> well done, well done, you. <laughs> just talk about the four wheel drive car. Um, just one thing, I'm very happy to see the Formula One team is now back at the front, mm -hmm. and somebody told me the other day they saw Tex wandering around in the drawing office, so I don't know what that means. So, uh, maybe I, I can actually there. answer that for you. I was at Brooklyn's a couple of months ago working for a good friend of mine who's at the back of the audience, James, this evening, and when I left James's event at Mercedes World, I wandered over and sitting in the reception of the Brooklyn's Hotel with a very splendid cup of coffee was Tex with a friend, and I said, oh, I haven't seen you for a while, Tex. He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, I'll come over a lot. He said, I've just been up to Silverstone for the classic event. We left home at 4.30 this morning to go to it. So I said, oh, do you ever go to the old factory? He said, well, of course I do. He said, and, and completely as only text can say this, he said, I've got an access all areas pass. I said, what makes you go in there? He said, got to make sure they're doing it right. <laughs> <laughs> and that sums him up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Final question to you, four-wheel drive car. You also spent some time restoring that. Am I correct on that? Or Don't, not? Go that yes. Don't go there. Don't go there. That was no. a challenge, wasn't it? Yeah. 
There you go. Ladies and gentlemen, Huey Absalom and our dear friend here, all the way from America. Thank you very, very much indeed, Alex. Now then, I'm looking at the back of the room there to see if we are... No, we're not. That's absolutely fine. That's the worst signal that an MC can ever get when the guy on the AV thing does that to you. So we're going to move along. Um, what I'd like to do, if I may, is invite Matthew in a moment to come back to the stage. Matthew uh, and I have worked, as you know, very closely on this, but you know, having got to know him a little bit better now, he told me the story about how in 1979... He went to McLaren and said, you know, I'd very much like to work in motor racing. And they gave him a job there as the sweeper up and the tea maker, he tells me. He then also had the nerve to go and see Teddy and Gordon Coppock. And he went along and said, I'd really like an engineering scholarship. And they thought about it. And Matthew therefore became the first person to have an engineering scholarship with McLaren. Um, it's an enormous pleasure to welcome Matthew back, but also I'm going to ask him to bring a gentleman to the stage who I think you all know pretty damn well, and I'm going to ask him to be joined by another former McLaren driver, Gordon Coppock, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, Gordon. Hey, Gordon. How are you? Good to see you. Also, I think, I'm hoping, out there in the audience is a man who... They both know quite well. Where's Bruno Giacomelli? Where are you, Bruno? It's Bruno. Come and join us. <laughs> hey, Bruno, good evening. Nice to see you. I'm going to yeah, hand over to Matthew. Thing. Matthew, I hope your microphone's working. Those early days, man who gave you a job there. Let's hear about it. Yes, so, Gordon, first of all, thank you very much for, you know, Giving me a job. Yeah, yeah, well. <laughs> so, uh, no, I was so grateful for you. But I want to tell you about my first day. I was, it's a, a summer holiday job, and Tom Quirk over there got, got me the job. And uh, the, uh, the job was sweeping up and making tea, but the very first day, they wanted me to take the sandwich order for the outside catering people. Okay? So I got the order, went around people, Took about 10 minutes. I phoned the number and, and, and put through the order for all the sandwiches for the outside catering uh, company. And after 10 minutes, this voice said, uh, Well, that's all very interesting, but this is Des in the workshop. You need to dial nine for an outside line first. <laughs> <laughs> so, from that, the fact that he let, waited you know, 10 minutes for me to explain, I thought McLaren was a great company to work for. But anyway, so. <laughs> Yeah. Gordon, M16, IndyCar, M23, what an amazing car the M23 was, came in in that particular year and then of course had a long gestation also in private hands. If you can just think back, what, what made the M23 such a special car? Well, um, <clears throat> we look really at what, what were other people doing wrong and... Uh, the first thing was that we, when you are uh, twisting the chassis, we saw how weak a uh, typical uh, opposition car was, and, and it twisted such a lot. Where, so that had it, the floor was the, the key to it. Just it move was your double, microphone. Double skin. Thank you. And uh, the weight difference was minuscule because, of course, we could go down in gauge of the material and we were very pleased and the result was that uh, from the first time the drivers got in it they always found a, a much more responsive mm. uh, car. Yes, indeed, talking of drivers who got in it, Bruno, just give you that microphone Hello. there. Hi, Six races with McLaren, yes. one in the first year and then five the following year. I have to ask you a question before we start. You must have had a fantastic rapport with the me mechanics because when Matthew and I went through all the historic photographs, there on the side of your McLaren, resplendent under your name, was Bruno Jacko Malley yes. next to a Guinness sign. Yeah. <laughs> and then underneath that, we found one that also said Jack the Lad. You must have got on well with the boys, yeah. Yes, well, it was a joke, it was a joke. But uh, I had my very first race with the N23, and uh, talking about that car, and uh, 
was simply fantastic and uh, it proved it actually because uh, along with the Lotus 72, they, were, they are the only two cars that they last five, six years. And uh, it is, it's, a, it's a record, uh, never happened again, you know, never happened. Mm. So the car was, was fantastic. The steering wheel was so light <laughs> compared to the N26, was, which was a pretty heavy steering. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, it was difficult, a difficult car, the N26. Looking back now, well, though. The N23 was, was a great car. Yeah. How does it feel now in later life, you look back and you say, I was a McLaren driver? Gives yeah. you great pleasure? Yeah, for me, it was, was uh, the beginning of my ex experience in Formula One, so it was amazing, you know. I was doing Formula Two at the time. The first Italian to win the European Formula Two Championship. Yes, in 78. Yeah. So I was doing Formula Two, and then I did also five Grand Prix with the, with the M26. Yes. And also in 77, when I, when I had my first race in Monza, the Italian Grand Prix, and in July, with the same car, I had his first race, Gilles Villeneuve, mm. at the British Grand Prix in Silverstone. So we drove the same, the same car, you know? Yes. And it uh, was, was great. It was, obviously, it was a bit, a bit difficult, you know, coming from a weekend, driving a Formula 2 car, and then driving a Formula 1 car, which was quite different. And, but it was a fantastic ex experience, and... Uh, was, was very good for me uh, the, for the years after, you know, and uh, yes, when, yes. I, when I did drove, uh, and uh, I was able, you know, to, to drive cars, fantastic cars, and uh, I, I led for a little while, and, uh, but for a very short time, unfortunately. Yes, yes, indeed. Well, it was wonderful having you there. Thank One you. of the great characters of Formula One, I know people still talk very fondly of your time. I'm just going to ask, excuse me to do this, I'm going to ask the boys on the AV desk just to put up a picture on the side screens for me. And I'm going to come back to Gordon. I can just imagine Adrian Newey who's with us tonight doing this can here. You, can you see the picture? Uh, if yes. you look at the McLaren, I think that's an M1A there, isn't it? And you look at that McLaren and the rest of the guys there are busy working on it. And Gordon, you're in a suit yeah. with a tie and I'm told <laughs> that was your very first day at work. Is that true? It was, it was, yeah. This is my first day at the racetrack, uh, and uh, it's a Brands Hatch. They used to have a non-championship race at st the start of the season, and um, Bruce said, "Come along." And uh, because I was wearing that that suit, Bruce immediately said, "Bro, you're doing the right front." And that's what I'm doing <laughs> in that picture. <laughs> Did you get any comments from anybody about what you were doing mechanicing a race car in a business suit? Uh, no. No, <laughs> no. A lot, a lot of um, leg pulling, shall we say, but uh, uh, I, it's uh, obvious with the, my best suit that <laughs> working on the... Putting right your best foot forward. Yes, absolutely, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's a real pleasure to see you here. Let me just take that microphone, if I may. Bruno, just one last question to you. You watch, you follow Formula One still? You watch it? You or not so much? I, I take long, long naps. <laughs> I'm not the only one. <laughs> no, no, exactly. So yeah. your fault, Adrian. It's all your fault, absolutely. <laughs> Probably not Adrian. Adrian yeah. is quite busy. You know? <laughs> yeah, indeed. Yeah, indeed. But for me, you know, it's, it's different. No. Yeah, it's and just looking back in those days, of course, we had, you know, Freddie Hunt's here this evening. As I said, we had characters like James there. You know, any stories that you can think about that are repeatable here this evening, really? I, 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 really, uh, I really don't know. I, I, you know, the memory now starts a bit, you know. That's called no, selective I, memory. You know, That's I, remember, I remember that James, you know, at the race weekend, you know, the, those five races I did, he used to come down at the hotel, down for breakfast. And uh, he, he had a, a girlfriend. No. Uh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Never. No, uh, uh, a, a beautiful girlfriend. I yes. remember. And uh, he, he was great, you know. He was James, he, James was very... I, I think he... He actually, he was much better than what everybody thinks. Mm. He was really, you know, he could uh, um, uh, stay with the, with the Lotus 79, with the N26, 
which wasn't an effect, uh, a ground effect car, you know? Mm. While the, the Lotus 79 was an, uh, a ground effect car. So he, wa he was really quick. Yes. He was really quick. Yeah. At, obviously, at that time, I wasn't really uh, uh, at the top driving. Uh, besides that, the N26, as I said, was a, a very difficult car for me to drive. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but he was a, a great driver. No. I think uh, he, he, he deserved more than what he, what he, what what he achieved. Uh, what, yes, obviously, sure. It's, it's worth mentioning, I was talking to Freddie earlier, for, for all of you, when you came up the corridor this evening past that wonderful MP44, you'll have seen some remarkable... Uh, somebody said to me, what beautiful black and white photographs. They're not, they're actual pencil line drawings and they're done they in your are. event program. You will find more details of them. Lovely Emma Capener, who is responsible for those. And there's a beautiful one of James downstairs. It's a pleasure to have you here, Emma. Mm -hmm. And thank you for your lovely work as well. It's much appreciated. Mm -hmm. I'm just looking at the boys over there on the AV deck. Are we still on one of those or are we... Okay, I am going to say, Gordon, it's been an immense pleasure welcoming you. Thank you for being with us here. Mm -hmm. Thank you for letting us show that photograph of you in your best suit. And thank you for everything you did for the team. Mm -hmm. Matthew, yeah, it's his I'll fault that you and I have spent the last year working together. I know, with Bruno, you know, I know. got a lot to answer for. Con no, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, thank please you. show thank your appreciation you. for thank our you. three guests. Thank you. Okay, see you later, Bruno. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, just while things have been going past, there's a few people we should also mention in the audience because I'm sure you can imagine, excuse me, moving around the stage, I'm sure you can imagine when you put an evening like this together, there's so many talented people and we've got so many stories to tell in the audience. Matthew and I went through the list, but we thought we should mention a few people over here. Uh, let's start, I think he's sitting over to my left somewhere, I can see him there in his blue jacket. Over 100 touring car wins in class and overall results, and over 70 wins in Formula 3. He put the odd good driver through his Formula 3 cars. Guys like Ayrton Senna, Mika Hakkinen, who's here this evening, Rubens Barrichello, Eddie Irvine, Jonathan Palmer. Dick Bennett, <laughs> welcome to see you. Uh, another gentleman who is always so incredibly charming whenever you say to him, Emmanuel Piro, where are you? I can't see you out there. There he is, Emanuele. Not only do you probably know more about Suzuka round and round than any other person on this planet, you've also achieved an incredible feat, and I'm sure everybody in the room knows, but if they don't, Emanuele, five times Le Mans winner. That took some doing, my friend. Now then, a gentleman who many of you know his name, but he was always behind the scenes. Somebody who, in the Marlborough days, really could have called him the Marlborough man, but I never saw him on a horse with a hat or anything on. Um, he was part of a magic partnership with the late John Hogan, or Hoagie as we all knew him. Graham Bogle, where are you? <laughs> Sitting down here. Graham and Hoagie really were a special treat, and Hoagie was the only guy, and I remember this passionately from my time, when we moved into the middle factory after Boundary Road with all that beautiful grey Voco furniture, Hoagie used to deliberately come into Ron's office and ask for an ashtray and light a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> and I always remember we used to have our meetings and I would look at Ron's face and I would think, this office is going to be so clean when Hoagie leaves later today. <laughs> also, Hoagie and Graham... Uh, at the time, many of you will remember, many drivers wore the MWCT, the Marlborough World Championship Team badge. It was on all of the clothing of there. At one time, 30 drivers out of 32 Formula One drivers in the days when we had lots of them and pre-qualifying were MCT, uh, MCWT drivers. And without Hoagie and Graham's effort, many, many of the drivers we know and love today just wouldn't have made it without their backing. And the reason I'm saying all of that is I was very privileged this evening to sit at my table is none other than Hoagie's son, Andrew. So, Andrew, welcome. I'm really, really glad that you joined us this evening. Thank you for coming along. <laughs> Stuart Grove of Ilmore Engineering, where are you? You're a man that knew a thing or two about it. Is Stuart in the room? There he is, sitting over there. Sorry, Stuart, the lights are a bit bright this side. Welcome, thanks for everything that Ilmore did. And the current team, <laughs> these names will make a view of you smile. Indy, Gary Wheeler, Les Green, they're all over at the Velocity event in Sonoma. 
They gutted they cannot be here with us tonight, but they said, unless I gave them a shout-out, they'd never speak to me again. So there we are, boys. You got your shout-out, and they're missing us not being here. So there we are. Um, Our next two guests come from very, very different backgrounds. Um, This is a man I spoke to at the 50th and thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed meeting as I walked down the corridor, as he did this evening. He stood very quietly to one side, just watching everybody come in. And we got chatting. And uh, he was one of the men who rescued Nicky Lauda from that burning Ferrari and that awful accident at the Nürburgring. And when we questioned him before we went on stage, I said to him, what do you remember most about you know, arriving on the scene and seeing the Ferrari in flames and jumping in and standing on the car and pulling Nicky out? And very modestly, he said, I remember ruining a really good pair of brand new racing boots, which I thought was a bit strange. And that person is, of course, Brett Lunger. But further more than that, the other person I'd like to ask to the stage is a very experienced journalist and an all-round really super guy, somebody I've known through my luck of being in Formula One and other motorsport. He's a journalist, he's an author, and he's a man who occasionally straps himself in a land speed record car and tries to do over 300 miles an hour in his Stay Gold project, and that is journalist and author David Tremaine. Will you welcome Brett Lungo and David Tremaine to the stage, please? Good to see you, mate. How are you? DJ, how are you? Yeah, you both look very, very well. Let me hand the microphone over. I'm going to do something a little bit unusual. Um, We talked about this. We've had lots of conversations with people leading up to this. And I'm going to ask these two guys just to talk a little bit about two particular people. I'm going to go to you first, David. Tell us a little bit about Nicky Lauder. Wow. A couple of good stories. I remember Robin Hurd went testing at Thruxton in F2, I think at the end of 71. And Nicky had had one lap ahead of uh, Ronnie at Rouen. And that was the one time people sort of thought, OK, maybe this guy's just not a, a moneyed Austrian. Maybe he's quite good. And Ronnie would go out of the test, set a time. Nicky would get in the car and equal it. So Ronnie would go out and go quicker. Nicky would get in the car and go quicker. And Robin's thinking... Oh, my God, we've got two superstars on the team. We can't even deal with one of them. So that's one of the stories I like about Nicky, but what I love, Monza 1976. So he's just come back from the accident. Uh, Enzo Ferrari decides he doesn't want a crippled driver in the car. So he's already got Carlos Reutemann, got Regazzoni. Hell, I've got to have a third car for Nicky. So when Nicky gets to Monza, there's all sorts of extra medicals and silly things that he's put through. And he's slow and he's scared and the car slides and he panics. And he goes home to the hotel and cries. And then the next day he thinks, right, gets out, shows everyone what Nicky Lauda is really made of and qualifies, I forget where, but it was ahead of the other two. And then he destroyed them in the race and finished fourth. But another story, which I love more than any, was South Africa 77. So he hates Reutemann, and he wants to really just destroy him, which he does. He wins the race. He's got something under the car, which turns out to be a bit of Tom Price's roll hoop. And he's got no oil, no water. The thing is dying on its feet. And Jody Schechter um, is coming in the wolf. Uh, Where's Bob? It's your fault that Jody was catching up with him. But Nicky hangs on, and he wins the race. And then he's absolutely stoked. He's back. It's the first thing he's done since the accident. Um, He's just so happy with himself. He gets on the podium and he's told about Tom Price. And that completely ruins it for him. But there's a little extra anecdote to the story. He's being interviewed afterwards. And a guy, he keeps looking at this guy and thinking, I know you. Don't I? I know you from somewhere. And the guy says, no, I don't think so. And then he says, yeah, I do. I know who you are. When I had my accident, my first interview, you were the guy who asked me the question, what is your wife going to do now, Herr Lauder, now that you're ugly? (laughs) So I'll tell you what, you can take this trophy and you can shove it. That, to me, is Nicky in a nutshell. (laughs) Thank you, David. Right. 
you and I, as I say, talked a lot about those early days. You're an incredibly modest guy, and one of the things I know you said to me earlier that you've stopped doing it now, but you spent a lot of time in the US doing mercy flights, uh, flying sick people where they needed to go at no cost to themselves, and I know you've done many, many trips, and you actually said you missed that these days, but... Uh, that was actually special. I, I, I was fortunate to have a chance to get into aviation. Um, we had a twin-engine jet, very, very qualified jet. We did 156 of those um, Mercy flights, some for, for wounded veterans, uh, which is close to my heart. But um, this has been part of my life. I've been blessed to have skills. I like to give back. I like to give something back for the things that have come my way. Mm -hmm. So aviation is good. I miss it now. Now I've got to get my, my belt off, go through security. The, uh, having the jet, you put your car in the hangar, get in the plane, and go where you want to go. <laughs> yeah, I miss it. Wild side. When you're talking about wild sides, tell us a little about James, James Hunt. Oh. Those days when you were working in the sport with him. James Hunt, yes. James was a legend in his own time. And that's before he even got in the car. Mm. Mm. He had a party reputation. He did. But that was not accurate. James was a professional. I remember, that, I remember the first race we did with, I did with the Hesketh team. It was in Austria, the Austrian ring. And James and I were down before the first practice having breakfast and talking about our strategy. And he's going like this going like this. Susie Hunt's up in the, in the room, in the suite, putting her makeup on. Funny, James said, hey, we're out of here. So Susie was left in the hotel. James went to the track, did his job. He was a professional. Now, you might ask, how would he fare today? How would James Hunt get along today? I think he'd be quick. In those days, we had track limits, and that was Armco. Today, <laughs> today the track <laughs> limits are different. And James, James had his fair share of track limit violations when we were racing, but today he'd just go off and go back on. Of course, he'd accumulate maybe seven or eight five-second penalties, which might put him back a little bit, but he was quick. Today's drivers are, are good, too. I mean, look at Lando. Look at Oscar. These guys are really good. You saw in the beginning of the season, eh, not quite where we wanted to be. They got a little bit better, a little bit better. About mid-season, it really started to click. Do you know how that happened? Richard, you probably know, but I promised I wouldn't tell anybody except since this is McLaren fa family, so I can just share this secret. Was it technology? Well, okay, they spend, what, $300 million a year? McLaren spent back then three to five million? So maybe the technology has something to do with it. But there's a secret. Zach Brown was able to get into their heads. He said, to, they had a meeting, he said, I'm gonna have Emerson Fittipaldi Yoken Mass, come by the factory, maybe get fitted for the car. Oscar said, uh-oh. Lando said, uh-oh. Now, these guys were quick, but after that, they were really quick. <laughs> so job security might have something to do with it, but these guys are good. Now, let's go forward. Let's go to next year. These guys are going to be really good. All I have to say is, Red Bull, get out of the way. <laughs> McLaren is coming through. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, two views. I'm going to ask you to stay actually where you are because we were trying desperately hard to connect with somebody just now uh, who I'm sure has got a few words to say to Gordon. And I'm sure it's going to give you a great pleasure. We, we've been really working hard to try and get him joined up. And I think this time, rather than over a telephone, as we did on the 50th, he's actually going to be live on screen. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please give a big round of applause for none other than Emerson Fittipaldi. <laughs> hi, Emerson. Hi, hi. It's late and it's past your bedtime in Spain, but thank you very, very much for joining us. I understand you're down there with, uh, with Emerson Jr., which is why I know you couldn't join us tonight. You'd intended to be here with us. We just asked to come back to the stage with Matthew. We have a guy I think you know quite well and you might like to talk to. Gordon Kopak, what have you got to say? Great, great. Uh, anyway, it's a pleasure to be with you guys. Uh, 
I hope that next year commemorating the 50 years of our first world championship will be a much bigger party. <laughs> With table racing, table testing, I'll be there. It's promise. We have to enjoy the 50th anniversary next year. Absolutely. The first world championship with my client. And, uh, you know, I, I, I have a story that possibly many people don't know, but uh, when, when I was contacted with Philip Morris by Barbara, Patrick Duffler, who was the marketing director at that time, uh, he said, Emerson, you go to England and you choose the team for Marlboro for the next few years. I said, myself, he said, yes, you go there. And at first, I knocked the door to Bernie Atkins from Bravo, was doing a great job. And then uh, I went to Kent Hero. You know, this was the end of 73, Jack Stewart retired, said it could be a, a great place. And then we replaced Jack Stewart in tears. And then I went to my client. First time I saw the team, I, I met Gordon. I knew the M23 was a fantastic car. Uh, the team was smaller than Bravo, smaller than Tier, but the people involved. That was the uh, Europe uh, Philip Morris headquarters, and I told it has to be my client. And that was I was so lucky to meet this team. I was so lucky to join this team, and to be able to to have so much fun for two years. I want to thank everybody that worked together with me on the two very special years I had with my client. Thank you, and God bless you guys and your family. Emerson, thank you so, so much for making the effort. We've been speaking with your right-hand man, Fernando. We've been chasing you all over the Southern Hemisphere, and you've come and you've made that call. I know you can still hear this, but thank you so, so much for joining us this evening. Gentlemen, how do we follow that? Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Gordon. Thanks, Brett. Thank you, David. Appreciate it. So... The excitement keeps on coming, doesn't it? Um, let's have a look. Where do we go from here? Ah, now this is going to be an interesting one. Um, my erstwhile colleagues down on the AV desk there, you, David, you've got a photograph there, haven't you, that um, I'd ask you to put up. Do anybody recognise that? I think you will do, because that was the remains of John Watson's car from the shunt at Monza, which many of you are familiar with. It really needs not a lot for me to introduce the next two people to ask you to welcome one of the world's most demanding, but certainly the most successful technical directors and a former director of McLaren International and the man who notched up the first victory for the team in 1981 with the MP41 at Silverstone. Huge pleasure. John Barnard and John Watson. Hello, JB. Hiya, Watty. Good to see you. Right, gents, there we go. We've also, actually, we should mention somebody very special who's here this evening because I remember then, I wasn't even in the sport, and I was reading about this amazing new material that JB and the team were going to use, and many of the teams thought it would just be a cloud of dust if it had a shunt. You remember all that rubbish. One of the guys who was there who really did that work and has made a special trip over from the United States to be with us in our audience a former Hercules aerospace man who knew that program, program intimately. Robert Michael, where are you? Where are you, Robert? There he is, Hercules Aerospace, Robert. JB, tell us, about, tell us about those early days. There you were, joining McLaren. You came in, you decided to use carbon composite materials. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I just finished the Chaparral IndyCar, and um, that was a bit of a groundbreaker, and I thought... Well, I met Ron, and, and Ron said he wanted to go Formula One. And I immediately thought, you know, 
has he got the money? <laughs> <laughs> and um, anyway, we did, I did a deal with Ron and started thinking about what I was going to do because I had basically I had a year before we were going to go racing. So I felt, you know, I had to make a step somehow. And that was right in the middle of the ground effect period. So I thought, how can I get the best ground effect? So I need to make the chassis smaller, slimmer, etc. So how do I keep all the mechanical properties? So, you know, that's when I started looking at carbon fiber. And uh, I think it was Neil Trundle actually got me talking to a guy at British Aerospace at Weybridge. So I started talking to this guy, Arthur Webb, and, um, and basically just decided that's, that's what I've got to do. I've got to make a monocoque out of carbon fiber. And I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know how to use it. I didn't know calculate it and all sorts of things. So um, I got talking to Arthur and um, just went, you know, used the, used the old um, basic uh, approach of get stuck in and do it. And, of course, at that time, there was a, a guy out in Hercules as well. It was uh, young Steve Nichols, wasn't well, it? Well, once, once I got the design done, um, then we had to find somebody who could build it. And um, I had I'd known Steve um, for a while because of the IndyCar, my period in IndyCar racing. And Steve was the Gabriel Shock Absorber man, I think it was. And Steve, I got talking to Steve, and he said, well, Hercules have got a real good R&D department, so maybe you should, you should talk to, you know, try Hercules. And so Ron being Ron, picks the phone up and says, you know, <laughs> you know, I can't remember who the name was, I think it was Bob Randolph, wasn't yeah. it, that you talked to? And uh, Bob Randolph was in charge of the R&D. And Ron said, come on, let's go, let's, let's go over there. So we put the uh, wind tunnel model in a box, if I remember, and took it with us to Hercules and sort of, Gave them the pitch, basically. This is Formula One. I mean, this is Salt Lake City. These are, these are all Mormons everywhere, you know. I mean, what did they know about Formula One? So um, we, uh, we sold, them the, sold them the deal. And they, but they were really interested because um, they wanted to do anything that was different, new, and use, stretched the use of carbon. They were just into it. And it was so different to the approach we got. We had already approached several companies in England, in mm -hmm. Britain, for... For, for building the monocoque for us, building the carbon monocoque, and they were just like, oh, you're all mad, you know, you're, it's way too, you know, this is way, way too, ex too complicated, way outside your sphere sort of thing. Yeah. So then Hercules came along with a completely different approach, and we just, we just headed off, and, and, and that's what happened. We made all the mold tools here, sent it out there, and they laid up the first monocoque. Steve will probably kill me for telling you or saying this. You may even know it, but we were talking the other week and he said to me, and you know, I was still in Hercules at the time, and he said, Ron and JB turned up with this cardboard box with a model in. And uh, apparently, you know, sort of you guys stepped out of the room for a few minutes and they phoned Steve and they said, we've got these two English guys over here with a Formula One car <laughs> model. You know, are they, are they for real? Steve said, yeah, for sure. They've got a really good idea. And, yeah. you know, it, it grew from there. But, of yeah. course, the man who tested it to its ultimate capacity yeah. was the man on your left-hand side. John, you and I talked about this at an event we did not so long ago together. Give us that memory of uh, when you saw an engine in the middle of the track and you thought, Jesus, somebody's had a big shunt. <laughs> well, first of all, that's the first time I've seen the rear of the car. When I had the accident at Lesmo 2, I got out of the car, and just to my left, there was an engine sliding across the racetrack, which I threw, assumed a car following me had also had a major accident. I didn't realize it was my engine. <laughs> but <laughs> when I looked around, I realized I didn't have an engine, didn't have a gearbox, didn't even have a gear lever, because it went out of the chassis as well. But actually, seeing that photograph, I didn't realize that the back of the monocoque itself had been you know, literally pulled just asunder. pop the picture up on uh, the side screen again, guys, if you would. There it is. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's amazing. But the point of all that was, when John designed the car in conjunction with British Aerospace and, and Hercules Corporation, the whole essence of the car, apart from the, 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 the structural integrity of the car in terms of its rigidity, and the most important thing ultimately was the repeatability, because you didn't get a Monday morning car or a Friday afternoon car. Every car was the same. And that was a big, big part of what John was trying to achieve. Now, we didn't have crash testing as modern Formula One does. Crash testing was done in, on the job. And <laughs> I had one big accident, which was Monza. And sadly, it was a, I think it was a brand... Was that a brand new monocoque or not, John? Uh, 
I think you've probably had number two, actually. Yeah, I think the De Crasheris had number one. Well, Andrea, my, my young Italian teammate, Andrea, who came into the team at the behest of Philip Morris, and he had 17 accidents, I think, in 18 races. And he always said, well, the reason I have accidents is because I don't get to test. But the reason he didn't get to test is because the team were always putting his car back together again. <laughs> but I, I gave it the big test, undoubtedly. But, I mean, it, when I had the impact, it wasn't a massive impact. And I sort of I thought, shit, that's not a great deal. And I was pissed off because of what I was trying to do. There's a couple of cars ahead of me. And I was trying to line up on the exit of Lesmo 2. I just ran too wide over the curb, and the bottom of the car hit the curb, and it just rotated it round. So I was pissed about that. But obviously, when I saw the back of the car, <laughs> the damage onto the car, I was even more upset. But the reality was, a few days later, there was a test held at Donington when a certain Austrian driver, known as Lauda, N, uh, <laughs> made a trip over because he, he needed a cash input. His airline had struggled, and he needed a big load of money. And the only people who could give it to him was basically Philip Morris and Marlborough and McLaren. So he came over and drove the, I remember, the original MP41. And I drove it before him and did a timer. He drove the car. said, oh, the car understeer is too much understeer. I can't drive the car. John, you need to fix this car. And whatever he did. And he, anyway, he made us come back and won his third Grand Prix. But the, the, fun, the foundation of the car was what John designed into it. And the whole structure of the car, from the nose to the back of the monocoque, certainly, without doubt, it saved me serious injury, possibly more. And Andrea, sadly, no longer around, mm. had 17 accidents and never even scratched himself. Watty, the one, thank you for that. The one thing I remember when you and I met recently and did that talk in Oxfordshire for a different organisation, you talked about you know, your early upbringing and how much you and the family loved racing. You talked about your dad being in the grandstand watching you win that race at Silverstone in 1981. How did it feel for you knowing dad was there watching you achieve that after you know, all the aspirations of those early years? I mean, on a personal level, it was a very important day because my family saw the victory, winning your home Grand Prix, and it was an unusual victory because of a variety of reasons. But aside from what it was for me, what it was also for, for Ron, for John, for Marlborough, for the whole McLaren team, was vindication of the technology that they have brought to Formula One, which is now the norm. I mean, how far ahead of the times was what John produced and what Ron and... But just the energy that they put in, the ambition, the drive, and, I mean, the standard, just the, the elevation of the technical design and every part of the car, the, the parts in the car. I mean, I, all I remember is the front uprights. I remember looking at them and I said... John, those things, when I put the brakes on, the webs are just going to shear. But I didn't understand enough, but John did. And mm -hmm. some of those parts he had actually, were, I think, were made in North America because they had particular materials. But just the car was just so far ahead of its time in every element. And it was a fantastic car. And it was the foundation for how many world championships, drivers' championships, did this partnership win, and then all the way through old Mika and up to Lewis in 2018. Mm. It was an amazing time. I mean, I look back, John and I have laughed about this together sometimes, and we talked about it at the 50th, but slightly less volatile, JB, than you were in those early days, perhaps? Yes, a little more sort of... Uh, You've been around me long, have you, Richard? Well, <laughs> not lately, no, but uh, I do remember one particular day when we were in that little office in Boundary Road, and I'm not quite sure what kicked it off, but I'll describe it as you came up to see Ron. And Joe Ramirez and Malcolm Billiard said to me, the safest place in here for the next five minutes is under the desk. <laughs> <laughs> and here you are having dinner together tonight. Lovely to see you back together. Yeah, it, was a, it was a good relationship. I mean, it was, a, it was like a marriage, you know, love and hate. So. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, there we go. I've just been told we're there. Ladies and gentlemen, John Barnard and John Watson. Thank you. Just like a marriage, there we go, a bit of advice for us there. Um, we worked very, very hard in the recent weeks, Matthew in particular, spent hours and hours on the phone with a certain diminutive little Frenchman. Um, Alan desperately, desperately wanted to be here tonight, but his life has gone in a different direction. 
and to give me a bit of a breather and also have a, bit, a quick a glass of water. Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear from Alan Prost. Good evening, everybody. I am so disappointed that I cannot uh, be with uh, you all tonight. Uh, I thought I could do it until the last, uh, the last minute, but uh, tomorrow I have to leave first to Dubai, then uh, uh, Pekin and uh, Seoul for a deal that with my new company we're making with the battery companies in these countries and I have, I have to go there, it's, um, it's, uh, it's my new life. <laughs> But uh, in any case, I just wanted to send you this message that I, uh, obviously I'm disappointed. I'm thinking a lot about uh, you all, all this uh, family. I use the, the term family because I think it's uh, the, the word that represents the most, the, the ambience at McLaren. It was uh, my best years in Formula One, it's obvious. Even if the last year was 89, was a bit difficult as everybody knows. I cannot, uh, I cannot keep uh, a negative aspect of this uh, of this year because it's the whole package. It's a part of the tra trajectory of a Formula One driver. You 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 have some up, you have some down, you have some difficult moments. But at the end, what uh, what stays in my mind is uh, with um, uh, that was again my best years, but uh, fantastic relation on the human side. Uh, you know, with the technical part, with the with the management, with the, all the drivers, and um, I mean, when I see Formula One today, obviously, I, I'm sure that we cannot get the the same thing, the same aspect, and uh, I really enjoy that. I keep that in my mind. It will always tell my family when people ask me about my best souvenir. I always say that it's uh, McLaren is a is a family. So when you when you talk about family, you never forget, you know, again, you have some up and down, but you never forget the, the, the people. I don't want to tell any names or, you know, uh, they will, everybody recognize that because we are a group of uh, people. I, I would really enjoy to be with you all uh, tonight, but uh, I just want to tell you that I'm with you. I'm going to be always with you. I really regret one thing is, uh, when I bought the Ligier team in 96, I think, 96, 97, I was uh, part of the McLaren team again, you know, for the second period. I would have, if I could, I would have never left, you know, and uh, maybe today I would be still part of this uh, family. Uh, but anyway, enjoy and uh, we keep all together. Have a nice evening. I hope you enjoy a lot together. Bye. Yeah, many of us shared some wonderful times with Alan. He could be incredibly mischievous at times, but also true professional. So lovely to get that from him. Excuse me. It leads me very, very neatly into my next section. And please, I hope you're bearing with me as we go through all these various interviews this evening. Uh, our next guest, all the way from Japan, uh, the chief of, well, senior engineer on the V6 turbo program and also the V12 was Michio Kawamoto, and also today still working ferociously on making Honda a global success name is none other than Toyoharo Tanabe. Ladies and gentlemen, they're here with Steve Nichols. Please welcome them to the stage. <laughs> Kawamoto-san, my pleasure. Cool. Tanabe-san, welcome. Good to see you. Steve, how are you, mate? Good, Good to see you. That was a perfect feed into talking to you. Chassis number three, MP44, parked down there in the corridor that we all walked past this evening. Kawamoto-san, for you, the question. Yeah. Very experienced, that incredible turbo engine, mm -hmm. and then followed up by the V12. When the team won so many races, 15 out of 16, in 1988, what were your feelings for Honda at the time and the success that you achieved? Well, not so much. <laughs> we, the Honda, designed the V6 engine, not only for the McLaren, but also the Lotus we Absolutely. supplied. But uh, the engine is not so excellent because the Lotus run two seconds slower 
than your <laughs> shash. <laughs> <laughs> that means uh, we had a big success in 1988, not only the engines, but also shash is excellent. <laughs> so, so, thank you very much for your excellent design. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Kaomoto san. Steve, you and I have talked a lot about MP44 various evenings. Great evening together at Brooklands, which was quite an adventurous evening, but we won't go into that now. Um, when you see the car now, what emotions do you have about the, the success that we had with MP44? What does it make you feel? Well, it looks, uh, by today's standards, pretty simple. Uh, it's not easy to make things look so simple. Uh, it, looks quite, it looks quite nice to me, of course, and uh, the, the whole team did a great job, the whole, the whole design team, and, and then the people that manufactured the car, an excellent job to, to put it all together, the machinists, the fabricators, the laminators, and then the mechanics who put it all together and raced the car success, so successfully, and... And the drivers, you know, it was uh, it was a very good car and excellent drivers and excellent execution by by the whole of the McLaren team. And I just always thought of it as the, uh, you know, just an ultimate expression of all of McLaren's experience up to that time, everything that had uh, that had gone before. Uh, so you had that situation with with an excellent car and excellent drivers and the engines from our friends at uh, Honda. Yeah, they produced that engine. It was a year when the, uh, the normally aspirated cars had been introduced. They had three and a half liters engine, 220 liters of fuel. Uh, I can't remember, a 20 or 30 or 40 kilo weight advantage, so they were supposed to win. That was the way of the future, and the FIA wanted them to win. But even though it was only for the one year, Honda put everything into that engine and developed a fantastic engine. Yeah. <laughs> and also, it was only one year for the car, and, and uh, Ron dedicated everything to that year. You know, So we had uh, all the finance we needed. Uh, everybody put everything into that car and that engine, even though it was only for the one year. And everybody did such an excellent job, and uh, it was such a great uh, team effort. And as others have said, uh, almost really goes beyond teamwork and into the realms of uh, family. So I, I know later I'd, uh, I worked at Ferrari, and I, I, f I found it quite interesting that uh, <laughs> the Ferrari chassis department and the engine department were only separated by a little hallway and Japan was on the other side of the world and yet we worked better with Honda <laughs> than the two <laughs> elements of Ferrari yeah. ever did. So it, it was yeah. really a fantastic thing and, and, and such a great opportunity for me to be involved in that. And so I'm forever grateful uh, that I've been given that opportunity by John Barnard and by Ron Dennis, uh, it gave me the chance to do something I'd sort of dreamed about since I was 15 years old. So it was, cool. it was a Man, great It's experience. nice to hear. Nice to hear. And good to see the professor there as well. <laughs> Tanabe san, Honda continues to produce the most remarkable performance power units to this day. Formula One today, very challenging but also Honda still very much at the forefront. Uh, <clears throat> yes. Uh, first, I'm very proud to be here. I'm very honored to be here with uh, our McLaren family. And then, as you said, uh, we are running the Formula One this week this season as well, but uh, I'm sorry. I'm having a little bit uh, strange feeling. So we did a great job with McLaren. And then this year we are having a good 
season with Red Bull, but uh, uh, <laughs> 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 I'm just thinking. I wanted to break our history this year with Red Bull, but uh, we are going to make uh, another uh, history with different team, and then the Formula One team always pushing, and then we will make uh, another future. So I'm just working with uh, FIA for the 2026 regulation or some others. So and the people here worked very hard, and then the, some people working very hard for the future. So, and then that we learned a lot from the Formula One. And then I learned a lot from McLaren team, engineers, mechanics, and uh, other staff. So, yeah, I would just like to say thank you very much from Japan, from Honda. Thank you very much. Tanabe san, Kawamoto san, thank you again so much for coming all this way to be with us tonight. It means a lot. Your name will always be etched in that fantastic season. I'd love to personally see 17 races going McLaren's way rather than Red Bull's way, but that's another story. <laughs> and to Steve, well done, mate. Glad it sort of released your childhood dreams, as it were. And now you've got another one, which is your uber expensive road car, which is a lovely project. Ladies and gentlemen, Michelle Kawamoto, Mr. Tanabe, Steve Nichols. Well, here we go, another one minute break, which might be useful. Here's a chap we ought to hear from. Where's David Coulthard? Good evening, everybody. As you can tell, I'm in a sunny pit lane here in Austin, Texas, when I'm recording this message to celebrate six years of McLaren. It's played a huge part in my racing career. I did the nine seasons for those of you in the room tonight, uh, sorry for all the crashes and all the rebuilds, but boy, did you do it well, and I thoroughly enjoyed my time there. I know Richard is going to be taking you through a host of special uh, messages and surprises during the evening. I would have loved to have been able to join you, but uh, sadly, divorce keeps me on the road and seeking out new opportunities, so I couldn't be in the UK tonight. But I really wish uh, everyone a wonderful night. It's been an incredible journey. Uh, Bruce McLaren, I'm sure, is looking down. Very, very proud indeed. And to see McLaren coming back towards the front, most recently with the victory in Qatar with Oscar, was really something quite special. So have a wonderful evening, and thank you so much for allowing me to have been part of the journey for nine seasons. So, we move on. Ten years ago, at the 50th anniversary, I was hugely privileged to be able to interview, those of you that were there will remember, Dan Gurney, live from the Eagle's Nest. It was... It was an immense pleasure, and that's still available on a video out there on YouTube now. Dan, as ever, was incredibly charming. Um, we're going to go back to the States again. Uh, how are we doing over there, boys? Oh, look at that. Thumbs up, which is fantastic. We're going to visit the United States of America once again, technology allowing, which looks good. Uh, another person calling us from California. Ladies and gentlemen, where's Steve Hallam? Hey, there he is. Good evening, Steve. Hi. Um, I'm just going to explain the, the sad reason you're not here. Uh, it looks pretty much to me like you've still got the Ron Dennis clean desk uh, effort going on there in the background, I have to say. Sorry, Ron. Um, you can't be with us due to the fact that you've just undergone, undergone surgery and had a knee replacement and you're not allowed to fly. Is that, is that your excuse? Uh, that's, sadly, that is my excuse. And I'm, I'm devastated not to be uh, with you today in, in the UK, but unless I have the surgery done um, as it is uh, just over two weeks ago, I, I wouldn't be fit for the uh, Daytona 24 hours in, um, in January next year, uh, which is when they'll let me uh, off the leash again. So, so um, yeah, humble apologies from my side because I'm sure you have a room full of super people that I would just love to reconnect with. 
Well, I happen to know that you've been watching the show since it went live about an hour and a bit ago, so it's good to have you with us. There you were, joined as a race engineer, culminated in head of race operations uh, in 2007, 2008. You worked alongside Gerhard Berger, Michael Andretti, Mika Hakkinen, who is here with us this evening, Martin Brundle, Big Nige, and of course, Mark Blundell. Um, when we were talking, you said to me that you felt in your 18 years at McLaren that you that you thrived as well as you did because of being able to work in a well-structured environment. Is that right? Absolutely. Uh, I, I had joined McLaren um, from Lotus at the very end of the 1990 uh, race season. And um, just to, to walk into um, the factory as it was in Albert Drive, uh, and there were at that time, I think, around about 220 employees. And even, even then, in, in 1991, the factory was a little bit fragmented because of the growth of the company. And the environment that um, I walked into was um, one that expected success and um, delivered that success. And... Um, I'd left a team that had barely a hundred employees, and uh, you, you know, there's we we've been racing a couple of years earlier against the MP44 and with the same engine, and it was great to see Carl Motorsan and Tanabi San on stage just a few moments ago, um, and yes, the car was two seconds a lap faster than the one we had built to race in the same season. So, um, yeah. It, it was a privilege to, to step into, uh, into McLaren. We're very fortunate this evening to have with us Vivienne and Bianca Senna. They are here. They've come specially for this event this evening. And you and I, when we talked last week, we spent quite a bit of time talking about the Berger Senna relationship. Um, you said to me, Ayrton, the total perfectionist, and Gerhard, you summed him up as something and not a care in the world. Would you like to relay that story of the Ferrari keys at Monza? I think that's worth telling. Uh, yeah, yes. Well, we were, we were testing at Monza. It would have been, I'm pretty certain it was, well, it was either 91 or 92. Well, I, th I think it was 92. And um, uh, the, the two of them uh, arrived at the track after the, after the first day of running. And um, uh, Ayrton was giggling away. Uh, and um, I said to Gerhard, what, what the, what, what's been going on? And he said that they were in Gerhard's Ferrari, somewhere in the middle of, of um, uh, Milan. And obviously, with, with it being a, a left-hand drive car, the keys were accessible to the uh, occupant of the passenger seat. And they were at a, a busy junction somewhere in Milan, I don't know where. And Ayrton had reached over, uh, taken the keys out of the ignition and thrown them out of the window. <laughs> and, uh, and Gerhard was rummaging around in, 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 in amongst the traffic looking for the keys whilst Ayrton was dying laughing in, in the passenger seat watching this uh, extravaganza take place. So, um, yeah, it, it was one of those things where uh, you knew Gerhard was going to come back at him at some stage, and I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure it did, because uh, that was the nature of, of Gerhard at the time. Somebody once said to me, if you played a trick on Gerhard, you had to be pretty sure you had insurance, because you'd always get it back twice over. And I think that's probably very true. Um, Steve, we... Um, just briefly, if you will, Ron is here as our guest of, evening, uh, guest of honour with Carol, his partner, and you and I, not to embarrass Ron, but we spoke a little bit about you know the relationship and you working with him. You, you if I remember rightly, and I think I've got my facts right, you got taken ill at a race meeting, didn't you? Yes, it was in um, in uh, 1994 in Japan. I was feeling very unwell, and um, uh, uh, Sid Sid Watkins saw me and um, told me that as soon as I got off the plane when I got home, uh, I needed to go and see my GP. And 
I did that, and the GP said, I need you to go straight to this hospital. Um, I'm calling the, um, the uh, consultant now, and I need you to see him immediately. It was one of these, do not pass go, do not go home, do not do anything other than go to this hospital, which was in, I think it was in Charlton St. Giles, and I was living in Beaconsfield at the time. And uh, I did that. Um, my girlfriend at the time were, was with me, and I was admitted to the hospital. And uh, the consultant saw me and said, I need to um, perform some surgery on you. We're going to do it tomorrow. It's urgent. And um, this is what's going to happen. They were going to remove my gallbladder. And uh, I was sort of given the pre-meds and settled down. And it was about 6 o'clock in the evening. And the phone rang in my room. And I answered the phone. And the person at the other end said, Steve, it's Ron. And I said, uh, Ron, how, how did you know I'm, I'm here? And he said, don't worry about that. You're in the wrong place. We're moving <laughs> you first thing in the morning. And you're going to... Sid's Hospital in Whitechapel, and we're going to take care of you there. And I said, well, that, you know, they're really nice to me here. They're doing, getting me ready for surgery. He said, don't worry about it. Sid's spoken to the consultant. You're, you're being moved tomorrow. We'll be there at 9 o'clock in the morning to take you. And, I, and he said, just don't worry. We, we've got this. And I sort of put the phone down in sort of semi-shock because the drugs were protecting me to a degree. 30 seconds later, a nurse walks into my room and said, oh, Mr. Hallam, I'm sorry, you're leaving us tomorrow. <laughs> and I said, I, I'm really not sure what's happening here, but this is, that seems to be the case. And tr true enough, a uh, car arrives at nine o'clock the next morning and I'm bundled into it and taken across London to uh, Sid's hospital where Sid was waiting, and uh, the whole thing un unfolded from there. But, uh, yeah, that was a, uh, a... You've heard people mention the word family several times this evening, mm -hmm. and it was like that um, working in, in uh, McLaren in, in those days. It may still be, I don't know, but um, Ron, Ron took care of us. And it, it was a, a privilege and an honour uh, to be there in those years. Steve, a personal story, but thank you for it, because it sums up why we're all here this evening. Thank you for that. We're going to move on. I know you're going to watch the rest of the show from the safety of your clean desk there in California. <laughs> Fantastic that you could join us. Thanks for taking the time last week to chat with Matthew and I as well. Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Hallam. <laughs> now, here's the interview that I'm nervous about. <laughs> Never mind that. Our next two guests, mm, 1989 to 2014. Spent 25 years with McLaren. Went there as ops director and then moved to managing director and CAO of the McLaren Group and eventually CEO of McLaren Racing. And today he's the CEO of Aston Martin Performance Technologies. The other gentleman who's going to join him, regarded as the world's most successful designer, whose career has spanned IndyCar to Formula One. Successful periods spent with Leighton House, Williams, McLaren, Red Bull Racing. Remarkably, his cars have won 12 World Constructors Championships, 13 Drivers Championships, and to date, God damn it, he's won over 200 races. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Martin Whitmarsh, and none other than Adrian Newey. <laughs> this has got to be one of the most dangerous on-stage interviews. <laughs> David Tremaine, I can see David Tremaine's going, I just need a picture of this and I'm leaving now for the news desk. Martin, welcome. Great to have you here. Yeah, well, and that smile is terrifying me because when we, we spoke a while ago and you said, can I be mischievous? And I thought, God, I'm not going to be able to stop you, am I? 
I, I think you, you actually asked me if uh, I wanted to be on the video, and I said, no, I'm not, <laughs> I don't do media anymore. No, we're going to edit yeah. you out, don't worry. Yeah, so, uh, but anyway, no, I think, uh, I mean, I think a lot of people have spoken today about uh, you know, a family and how extraordinary it's been to be part of Formula, you know, part of Formula One, but also part of the McLaren family. Uh, and for me personally, you know, I, I was, I don't know how I got into, uh, into Formula One with McLaren in 1989. I knew nothing about sport, arguably I've learned <laughs> very little since. Uh, but it, I think it was uh, you know, an extraordinary uh, team when I, when I joined. It was the end of uh, Ayrton and, uh, and Alan. Uh, you know, we had Ron and uh, Mansour Ogier, who really were the fathers of the team and, and uh, just extraordinary human beings. Uh, you know, and I then spent you know, 25 years hiding behind talent. Uh, but you know, it was, it was an extraordinary time for the team. Uh, I look back on it as, you know, with much, much affection. Had some great times with you know, characters like Adrian here, and it was, it was a, a great time. Uh, and certainly when I left, I, I had no intention to ever be involved in Formula One again. I got involved in a lot of other different things, which I really enjoyed. Uh, but Formula One, as, you know, as we all know, everyone in this room, I think, has got an incredible pull. And uh, much as you know, common sense tells you there's other things in life, uh, you just get dra dragged back into it. So yeah, I'm sort of got a little bit back involved, and uh, yeah, I'm sort of you know we're a long way behind this gentleman here. Uh, we're you know we're in the early days of building what was Jordan, Midland, Spiker, Force India, <laughs> and, all the rest, uh, and yeah. turning that into a proper team. And that's uh, you know that was a project that I I didn't go looking for, but I then felt if I don't go and do that, I'm going to be kicking myself. So yeah. uh, I've, yeah, it's been. Early days yet. We've got a long, long way to go, but it's been a fantastic experience for me. But uh, yeah, obviously, I've got a, you know, tremendous memories of 25 years at McLaren. You know, some incredible uh, you know, personalities, people, talents, uh, mm. as I say, and it was just great to see them, work with them, learn from them, and it was a fantastic experience. Interesting, though, now you're heading up Aston Martin Technologies because, you know, Adrian and I, back in the days when we were together at Williams, Frank sort of blanched at the ideas of having an advanced engineering. And, of course, Williams Grand Prix Engineering then formed Williams Advanced Engineering. Red Bull now own two-thirds of Milton Keynes and are taking over the rest very shortly. And the team's... <laughs> sorry, Adrian, I've got to do it. And... Um, Formula One is now spreading its technologies and so many things. Interestingly, with Alan going off and partnering up with a French and a Chinese company now to look at battery storage. Incredibly important, some of the lessons that industry is learning, isn't it? Oh, and I, th I think you know, we're meant to talk about the technology and all the great opportunities. I think, you know, in truth, a lot of Formula One teams piled in uh, on something was w w which was called cost cap mitigation. Uh, we, all went, we, <laughs> we all went down that path. We all got our knuckles wrapped. Uh, and it wasn't quite as successful uh, for, for those purposes. But mm -hmm. no, I think, I think, you know, Formula One has got such a profile. It's, I mean, it's actually, just when you think it can't grow anymore, you know, now with America, Netflix, all those things, the sport's mm. just on fire. The value of teams is expanding, the opportunity to do some really you know, exciting things. You know, and Formula One is about talent. You know, that's what we've got in this room. There's so many talented, creative people uh, that gives you the opportunity to have that, you know, that intellectual property, that tech that technology, you know, the brand to go and do some exciting things. So, mm. you know, and I think Formula One's great, but it's, uh, I think Adrian will agree, it's, you know, it's really interesting to get involved in other sports, other areas of technology, you know, they're refreshing and, and you, know, you learn a lot from doing those other things and uh, you're stimulated as well. I think you, you know, I think Adrian will agree, you know, you, Formula One's, you know, a demanding, uh, you know, a demanding challenge, but yes. uh, to go and yeah. do uh, different things uh, and all the other things I've done outside of Formula One, you know, I, I, I tried and was for nearly 10 years out of the sport, uh, but it was great to you know, come back and be involved. But I, you know, I think I learned a lot uh, out doing other different things. Well, thank you for your contribution. It was a fantastic time. Adrian, turning to you. I spoke to somebody very senior at McLaren only a couple of days ago, and they asked me to ask you a question. They said, when the bloody hell are you going to stop? <laughs> 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 yeah, um, 10 years ago, I'd have said next year, but no, it's, it's um, I don't know, it's something I've always wanted to do since I was about 10 or 12. Um, I used to grow up reading all the magazines I could find on people like Gordon's, anything that was in auto car or something. Mm. I even went along to see Howden at um, Tiga mm. in uh, Caversham. He refused to give me a job, of course, quite rightly. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so, yeah, I mean, when I managed to get into, into motor racing from university, and, I can honestly say I've, it's been the most stimulating, exciting job 
kind of um, getting my first salary uh, or paycheck at, at the end of my first month at Fitzpold is um, as a young aerodynamicist, employed as uh, junior aerodynamicist, it turned out to be senior aerodynamicist as well. Yes. Um, I had no idea what I was doing. I got paid for it and everything else has been a blessing since. Of course since. you know why you got paid for it. <laughs> Actually, Matthew asked me to ask you a question. He said, in your McLaren years, what was your most memorable car? He said, but he probably won't say the MP418. Um, well, no, I mean, <laughs> the, 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 yeah, the, the 18s obviously wasn't... A, I've had two or three disaster cars um, in my career, and that was certainly one of them. But the reality is, you know, we have a, more and more we have all these wonderful simulation tools. And so in theory, you know more and more about what you're doing, which I think is, is the big contrast to, to Gordon's era, where you know, mm. had the opposite, where the rule book was that thick instead of this thick, but you had very little in the way of research tools, so it's it done on intuition and, and ideas. Um, but occasionally you have to push, and yes, the 18 was a, there were some, obviously some significant mistakes in it, but sometimes you have to do that, in my opinion, to, to learn from that. Um, it's painful at the time, but kind of you get through it and you grow out stronger, mm. and the team does as well, that's my belief. One of the things I always remember about you at Williams when you used to pop down to the drawing office, and that's a long time ago, and see you there. CAD and various other things were all just sort of starting to come, and we had bull technologies and things like that. You were always there sketching when other people were sat at machines, and somebody said to me the other day, you know, is Adrian still working on his drawing board? I said, I have no idea. Do you still sketch up like you used to I'm in the old days? the last dinosaur in the industry, yes. Yeah, Are yeah. you really? Yeah, You're yeah. still there sketching yeah, up, yeah. which is fantastic. Well, uh, to me, I mean, it's, you know, CAD systems obviously have developed and developed. I, I grew up on the drawing board. CAD systems didn't really start to achieve maturity until somewhere around the early 90s. Um, it's it's a it's a way of getting something from in here onto a medium, and to me, drawing, a drawing board's my first language. It's the one I'll always be most fluent on. Um, mm. For the younger generation, it's the other way around. So I, I just carry on doing what I've always done. Difficult question. I mean, obviously, because you're in a premier position at the moment, you're winning so many races and you know championship titles. You've been around long enough, you know, many of us in this room, you've seen the cyclical flow of Formula One, whether it was McLaren, its dominance, went into Benetton, went into Ferrari, and so it goes on over the years. How do you keep that momentum up that you've got in the team at the moment? Because you, in many ways, different characters, but when I watch and I listen to Christian sometimes and I watch the way the teams work, it almost reminds me of our early days here, you know, when we were all dominant. Do you have that same sort of rapport going within the team now? Yes, I mean, of course, it's, it's always difficult when you're... There's always a temptation to be, to become a little complacent, which is why I think when we, um, we made a complete mess of Singapore, actually, that was a very useful race for us because, you, a, a, when things go wrong, you tend to learn more from them than very smooth weekends, but it's also a bit of a wake-up call that, yeah. you know, it's the, the opposition is always close, and if you don't stay razor sharp, you're going to get your ass kicked. Well, if I can say it, and I'm sure everybody within the room would agree with it, we really look forward to a McLaren 1-2 and seeing you dragging along behind. <laughs> Ladies, and <g> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> I know Mar Martin and I exchanged an email, and he was going to ask me a question about the MP44, but I think we're <laughs> I'm not sure we're going to go there this evening, are we? Ladies and gentlemen, Martin Whitmarsh, Adrian Newey, thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Adrian. Thanks, guys. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're doing well, we're doing well, we're ahead of schedule. Let's have a quick one minute break. I think if I'm right down there, team, we should be hearing from none other than Mark Blundell. Hi everyone. Uh, for some of you who don't know me, my name's Mark Blundell, uh, AKA Billy. I've been a McLaren driver on a couple of occasions, back in 92, test driver, and also in 95 when I took over from uh, Big Nige. And listen, close to my heart. You guys, fantastic. Uh, big soft spot and I really do thank you. I'm sorry I can't be with you uh, these days, having to do a day's work and uh, running a business, but uh, I really do appreciate that uh, you're all there and you're supporting McLaren and 
having a great time with a reunion, 60 years, big number, uh, not so far away from that myself. So listen, enjoy, I uh, do hope that you have a great time, have a drink with me, because I'll certainly be having one to uh, remember you all. Um, probably a little memory as well. If Deadly's in the room, I owe you big time, because you owe me a pair of jeans. You cut off the legs. Do you remember December testing? I'm sure you do. And I've got the photograph where I was strung up in the car and fairy lights and lipstick on. Never going to forgive you for that, boys. Have a good one. Ladies and gentlemen, as I walked in this evening, um, I bumped into a former McLaren world champion, twice world champion. I said, how are you? He said, great, what time can I go? <laughs> and I said, no, you're not getting away that easily. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, our next interview is something a bit special, like they all have been this evening, but with 20 wins, 51 podiums, 26 pole positions, 25 fastest laps, 420 career points, to say nothing of being the Formula One World Drivers' Champion in 98 and 99. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please welcome Mika Hakkinen. <laughs> Good to see you. Mika, welcome. Let me pass you a microphone. Oh, it's um, my hair. <laughs> at least we've still got hair. We're looking good, eh? Um, it's an absolute pleasure and an honour to have you here, Mika. Thank you so much. I remember you and I first met, you won't remember, a very long time ago with the late John Connor from Philip Morris. We met in the Adelaide Hilton and you were driving a Lotus and I said to you, what's the plan? He said, I'm going to win the World Championship. And I thought, well, there's a proper guy who knows what he's doing. You're hugely popular with the majority of people who follow Formula One. But your majority of your career it was here at McLaren. What, what made McLaren so special that you, that you literally saw out your fantastic years with the team? Me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what a great answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Modesty value 100. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, it's so many things, many things, of course, and... and uh... <laughs> 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 Go on. Coming, coming this evening over here, I was really, really nervous. Why? I was really nervous and I was t thinking a lot of things, of course. You know, I haven't seen many of you guys and ladies for many years and, and I was wondering well, how would they look like? <laughs> <laughs> you know, how yeah. yeah, how yeah. they look like and um, what they're thinking after all these years. Uh, because uh, I retired 2001, so it's a quite a many years ago, and some of you I've met, and some of you I have not, and, and uh, I was quite nervous, and, and I, was, I was thinking in my mind all the time, what am I going to say? <laughs> and it's a horrible feeling. <laughs> you know, you keep thinking and thinking, and for a Finnish person it's very difficult anyway, you know. <laughs> so uh, I, I thought, I said, okay, I've got to say thank you, and, and uh, I think that's really important word, thank you. So, mm. so what, you, what you have done for me over the years in my career, it is amazing. Amazing work and, and, uh, and the patience, I would say, what you had with me because uh, it took me <laughs> quite a while to learn to <laughs> try to cut properly, you know. Uh, but uh, that's what I want to say, thank you. Oh, and thank you for what you did for the team. <laughs> this is going to sound a little bit strange. I, I'm going to ask Matthew to come back and join us on the stage, please. And I've actually, normally very calm as a presenter, but I've actually got sweaty palms because, well, let's get Matthew. Where is he? Matthew, come back up to the stage. Are you still mic'd up there, Matthew? Yeah. I think so, if I'm live, yeah. yeah. Good. Hi, Mika. Great to see you. Thank you All so right. much for coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mika, last Wednesday was the 25th anniversary of your first world championship. And of course, we wanted to celebrate that tonight. But. <laughs> but. <laughs> but. <laughs> but we're not going to do that. <laughs> no. Um, it's quite difficult to say this, actually. But three years before that, in Adelaide, we nearly lost you. 
It was a difficult time, Nico. I mean, it, for us to talk to you about that, we talk, Matthew and I talked for hours about this particular thing. But there was somebody we felt it would be very important that you should meet and you perhaps haven't met before. And I hope that what we're about to do doesn't put you in a difficult position. And it may be an emotional moment for all of us here, but there's a gentleman here tonight who was on that medical team in Adelaide. He was the first man on site and he was there. And if I can really say it in this way, and it's difficult to say it, he saved your life. I don't know, and I know from talking to him that you've not met, but it's our pleasure to introduce you to that man, Dr. Jerome Cocking. Please come to the stage. I've got to say, in, in absolutely no way did Matthew and I want to cause you any hurt from that time or fear from that time, but Matthew, when we launched into this event, over a year ago, started to research, and he phoned me one night and he said, there's a gentleman I think we ought to meet, and Jerome was very gracious. We met in Henley-on-Thames, and we've had several meetings with him. And I don't really think, Jerome, there's a lot more I can say. You were there, and you had to work with Mecca very quickly. Well, thank you very much, because <clears throat> this is very special for me tonight. Um, I'm in some extraordinary company tonight. Um, I have nothing to do with motorsport. I'm an intensive care physician. Um, and, I, yes, I was on duty that, that day in Adelaide, all those years ago. Um, and... But if I'm honest, I didn't expect to do much work. I was actually there to enjoy the day. But Mika here changed all that. <laughs> you remember, it's a street circuit. It was a fast corner, wasn't it? And there was no runoff areas. So Mika, you hit that wall very hard indeed. Yes. And I don't know whether you know just how close you got to a very different outcome, but I'm very proud to be here today to be the man that stopped you getting what could have been a permanent hypoxic brain injury. So it gives me enormous pleasure to be able to be with you here and seeing you in such good health. <laughs> it, it, was a, it was a very uh, a special time, of course, and, and uh, what, like I said, thank you earlier, it, it was also uh, that thank you is the part of the moment what I experienced with the McLaren team, and, and, uh, and the, 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 the you did your work, thank you. <laughs> Sounds horrible, but <laughs> you know, uh, and and uh, you did it really well. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it, it was a it was a it was a horrible time. It was a horrible time, and and that's why the McLaren team, Ron Dennis, uh, the the friends, all the network, what he had. Uh, gave the maximum support uh, in Australia, coming back to Europe, coming back to England, and it gave me time to recover. It was an amazing time, you know, and uh, amazing time, horrible time, and all everything together. But uh, I try to remember you, but it's very difficult. <laughs> uh, I think at the time you were in a fit state to remember much. Yeah. But now I don't never forget you know, when I see you. Know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mecca. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, Mecca, Jerome, I'm not going to try and add any more words to that. I think the moment is very special. And we are delighted, Mika, that you've joined us this evening. I'm sorry to jump such a surprise on you. Trust me, Matthew and I debated this one for so many hours. 
Ladies and gentlemen, thank you, thank you, Dr. Jerome okay. Cockins and our world champion, Mika Hakkinen. Thank you for that. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Jerome. Great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. How do you follow that? Yeah, how do you follow that, truthfully? Quite amazing. Let's do it by recognising a few people in the audience. We did a few earlier. We should talk about a few more. We mentioned Ray Rowe earlier. Tex, fantastic. I said, he said, who's coming? I said, it's quite a lot of people. He said, do you think anybody will have COVID? I said, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> that was the conversation. Ray, we talked about you earlier. Uh, still... A man who, quite honestly, you know, I've, I've said to people, Ray Rowe is a guy who could probably weld tissue paper. I think that's probably true. The other person, I had to pick up the phone to him the other night, but it worked. We've got Mr. Dealmaker himself, Ekram Sami here. Ekram, lovely to have you here, mate. Good to see you. Thank you. And although we only brushed sleeves earlier and had a quick word... It was fantastic. I don't know if any of you picked it up on the pictures on the screen earlier. There was a picture of the guys, very about five of them in the canteen, one of them reading the newspaper, a set of old blue lockers behind them, and written at a really oblique angle in chalk across the top was Dave Ryan. I, I, I could just imagine Ron having a situation where he saw you know, a chalk mark on the, on the uh, lockers in the room. But good to see you here, Davey. Thank you very, very much indeed for joining us. And also, Davey, I think it has to be said, thank you for everything that you did in your years at McLaren. We all appreciate it massively. Thank you very much indeed. <clears throat> if any of you get stopped and asked for a receipt tonight on your way out the door, that's because Bob Illman's here, former financial director. Bob, <laughs> lovely to see you here. <laughs> And, of course, race engineer Tim Wright, who probably did more miles to Suzuka in various guises in 88, 89 with the test program than any other human being alive. Tim, lovely to see you. Thank you for being here. And, um, amazingly, we're represented by the McLaren of today by another, none other than Neil Oatley. He's here. Evening, Neil. I've, act I've actually got to say, Neil and I first met when many years ago I started my career at Williams and Neil was very helpful to me there. But actually, Neil, we're really pleased, knowing of your work ethic, that you've managed to take three hours off and join us tonight and not be in the office. <laughs> That's uh, really good of you to join us. Thank you for that. Right, let's get into our next interview because we're doing well on timings, ladies and gentlemen. Formula One, we all know, dedication, commitment, attention to detail, say nothing of passion. Our next three guests have... Absolute oodles of all four. And this is quite an introduction, but please bear with me while I do it. One of the, certainly the nicest women ever to grace the pit lane. The wife of the legendary TAG CEO, Mansur OJ. The equally legendary Joe Ramirez, back on his recent trip, although his throat's not holding up too well because he had the air conditioning on in the plane too high <laughs> on his way back from Mexico. And of course, somebody who's been around forever. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please welcome Kathy OJ, Joe Ramirez, and Neil Trundle. <laughs> Evening, dear boy. Kathy, how are you? I couldn't be better. <laughs> Lovely to see you. Welcome. Great company. <laughs> I do hope so. I'm going to start with you. Um, you and I were chatting the other day, and um, Mansur first started going racing in the 70s. Yep. I first met him, I think, in 78 when he came with Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia to Monaco. That's, uh, oh. that's right. Yeah, yep. and then you were on the scene. I was. You were there. I. Let me give you this. The passion that he had for Formula One, I remember him uh, when I first started at Williams, he was a sponsor. Ron wasted no time at all in convincing him to come across and be part of the Tag Turbo TTE P01 program. It didn't take long at all. Yeah. Yeah. His passion was legendary. I mean, he, he never lost it for Formula One, did he? Oh, no, not a day. Not a day. Even when he was very ill, as you know he was, and several last bit of his life, yeah. he never missed a race. 
Never missed her. He always had ideas. He would always say, no, but they should have done that. Oh, I wish they'd done that, and blah, 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 blah. Uh, and I'm talking about from the hospital. So mm. he never lost it. Never lost it. Mm. Mm. I would never see anything put a smile on Monsoor's face more than if he was interfacing with Formula One, talking about Formula One, uh, being with people in Formula One, or being at a race. Being at a race was the sum of Mm. Walking down that pit lane, being proud of McLaren, you know, talking to people. And he loved people. Yeah. He really did. I think those of you who knew him knew that he, he just loved interfacing with everyone. And it didn't matter who you were in the company, what you did in the company, you were important. And he wanted to talk to you. He wanted to know how you felt about being at McLaren. And before he was at McLaren, we were, he was with Williams. And it was the same thing at Williams. Mm. Um, he was a man who loved people. He was a man who respected everyone and um, had a real true passion for racing. And I really think he was a very frustrated racer himself. Mm -hmm. He did drive a Formula One car. Did he? I didn't know he that. He did. And it was way back when Eddie Cheever was driving Formula One at the time. Anyway, he did a few laps and whatever and whatever, and he got out of the car and he did pretty well. And he said, gosh, you're just a few seconds off, you know, a good lap. <laughs> that's actually, t in today's <laughs> lingo, that's like, you know. <laughs> yeah, Half a day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, and he said, but Monsieur, do you realize, <laughs> he said, if you had to stop that car, he said, you'd end up with your feet wrapped behind <laughs> your head. And he said, it wouldn't be a good outcome. He said, get out of the car. <laughs> you, you make a very good point about him talking to anybody. I, I was in Monaco one year and I had a, um, a local regional UK journalist who had been wanting to go to a Grand Prix for many years and uh, we, we took him out and he came out. I was walking down the pit lane race morning and I bumped into Mansur and Aziz was with him, his brother. Mm -hmm. And he just nodded to me and I stopped and I said, oh Mansur, have you got a second? And I said, this gentleman works for a regional newspaper in the UK. I could have said... This gentleman works for the Financial Times. It made no difference. He spoke to him, and as you say, he took time with him. He explained why he was there, and you know, he, he did it in such a way. I always remember that he. I only ever saw one other person do it, and that was Michael Schumacher when he walked in a room. My wife Denise was with me, and Michael walked up to a couple, and this couple were in awe because Michael was walking towards them, and he walked up and he said, "Hi, I'm, I'm Michael Schumacher," mm -hmm. and Mance did the same thing, and I just thought then his humility was tremendous. And he sadly missed, and we're, we're very lucky to have you here tonight with us. I'm going to do a strange thing. I'm going to ask you to move across. I'm not going to stand with my back to you. That would be very rude. Next to the wonderful Joe Ramirez. Joe Aquino, welcome. How are you, mate? <clears throat> nice and close. <clears throat> Sorry about my voice, but first of all, I would like to uh, take my hat with you and Matthew for doing this. It's absolutely fantastic. <clears throat> I was always wondering what was that screen here. That's yeah. Look at that. You're a professional. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a, how, many, how much with time we have? It depends what you're going to ask me, you know? It's quite all right. I can just get going. I want to ask you a very specific question because I said earlier we have Vivian and Bianca Senna here this evening sitting there, which is a great honor for us to have them here. There's a video you'll see at the end of this evening that Ron has very kindly allowed us to show, and there's a couple of clips in it, particularly one of you, I think it was Monte Carlo, when you'd obviously, Ayrton had won the race, and the look in Ayrton's eyes when he talked to you is something quite magical. I mean, memory from you, if I can, and it's probably going to revolve around Ayrton, isn't it? Oh, <clears throat> yes, well, the, the, if you ask me something about Ayrton, my... my uh, the thing I will remember always about Ayrton, it was actually yesterday, 30 years ago, the Adelaide Grand Prix, which was the last Grand Prix mm. of Ayrton, mm. that he won um, in, yeah, 1993. Yeah. yeah, with the Ford Pound car. Yeah. It was a lot of things happening that weekend. First of all, Ert, Alain Prost was retired, and I was a very close friend to Alain. Um, we have, Ayrton did the pole position on a, it was the first pole position in 10 years from the Cosworth engine, which mm. was quite, quite a big thing for something Ford. to do for, yeah. for Ayrton. And, yeah. and Ferrari and McLaren were a 103 Grand Prix win. Therefore, whoever wins this, he will be the most successful Grand Prix at the moment. Mm. 
So at the starting line, it was her turn, and it kind of called me, and I thought, what do you want him? Maybe he want me to do the bells, but no, he always had a system to do his bells the last moment. So I went in the cockpit. Why didn't you talk to me in the walkie-talkie? So I went in the cockpit, and he grabbed my hand very, very hard, and he said, Joe, I feel very, very strong, very <clears throat> strange to do this for the last time. And I said to him, what if you're feeling strange? In my nose, we didn't yeah. ask you to go. <laughs> we didn't ask you to go, you know. And then I said, I cannot tell you how important it is for McLaren to win this. If you win this, I will love you forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I'm sorry. Even now we get emotional. He won the race. <laughs> Relax. He won the race, and then it was a um, a concert by Tina Turner. Correct. In, so we all went to see it, yeah, and yeah. Tina got yeah. Ayrton in the stage. On the stage. Sang simply, simply the best. The best. <laughs> well, yeah. you know, yeah, if yeah. the song would ever sing at the right time, I was here. It was an amazing moment, Joe. And the last thing, of course, I, I, Alain was retiring, and Ayrton and Alain finally, after four or five years of, you know, they sure shake hands and they embrace the podium. So that was great to see. No, it was, a, it, and to this day, we've never understood really what their conversation was, but it was lovely to see them come back together. Neil, you've, I'll, I'll show to give you the microphone. You had black hair 10 years ago when we did this. What's that, man? <laughs> I did what? You had black hair 10 years ago when we did this. Yeah, I had a lot of things 10 years ago that I haven't got now. <laughs> you told me you lost it all in the last two weeks. And <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Back. Listen, there you were, early days, Rondell Racing, you yep. and Ron, setting yep. off together. Yep. And then off you went to Tyrrell. Yeah. Yep. And then you and I were talking the other day. You came back, 88, there you were. Yeah, Ron got me back in 76 at Project 4. Yeah, indeed. And yeah. Pro Car as well. You're involved yeah, with Nicky on the Pro Car. And yeah. the start of Ron's association with Marlborough. Indeed. And then we built what was going to be the first uh, Project 4 Formula 1 car. Yeah. Which became MP41 with John and Steve and all the guys. Yeah. I mean, so what you've got here tonight, I think, is you've got um, BR and AR. You've got before run and after run. <laughs> yeah. So you've got the fantastic McLaren team, yeah. which were struggling, and we were a Project 4 trying to get into Formula One, and with the help of Marlborough and John and us guys at Project 4, we amalgamated, and so now we have after run, and so. Yeah, yeah. Indeed. And then you, you went on, to, after your spell in the 80s, looking after us all in the pit lane, 16 years in the gearbox shop. Yes, yes, we did some And good then, stuff. if that wasn't enough, then of course you've stepped out, and now you're a very well-known face in the heritage world, aren't you? Goodwood Festival, Goodwood Revival, all those events where you go. You know, you can't lose the passion. No. We're, we're all here, we all share that passion. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, don't tell Ron, but I'd have worked for nothing back in the... <laughs> <laughs> no, it's very true, very true. Uh, interestingly, at the 50th, when we introduced uh, Wally Wilmot, who sadly has passed now, as one yeah. of you know, the very early guys, he said the same thing. He said with Bruce, he said, Bruce was kind enough to pay us, but we yeah. never did say we'd have yeah. done it for free. So this is a unique gathering, isn't it? Very much. This is will it? never happen this again. Will never this is happen. very well, special. Well, hold on. Ten years' time. I'll yeah, thanks, again. mate. Yeah, I probably won't have any hair then, <laughs> let alone white. <laughs> One of the things I was going to ask you, you know, Joe, just natural, I was talking to Bianca earlier, Bianca Senna earlier, and whenever you talk about it, and it brings out emotions in all of us that perhaps, you know, we haven't seen elsewhere. How do you feel when you're at those heritage events and you're working on those cars that... Well, the, the spookiest time was when Bruno drove the MP44 at, uh, at the festival. Yes, yeah. Although we broke the gearbox, but, uh, and it wasn't his fault, by the way. <laughs> so 16 years in the gearbox shop and you broke the gearbox. Nice one, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, um, a, a special time. Yeah. Ayrton, Alain, I mean, I was only on the race team, so I was chief mechanic, 88, 89. Yeah. And we had just the best bunch of guys. Absolutely. I mean, each era is a different, but we had the best. And, um, and we, all, we all felt it, and we all knew it, of didn't course. we? Yeah, yeah. So Everybody else in the pit lane hated us, a bit like Adrian's lot well, at the right moment. Now, but I have to say, deal. you know, yeah, yeah. it was very special, yeah, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, indeed. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going to try and add anything to that. The wonderful Cathy OJ, Joe Ramirez, Neil Trundle. Thank you. Thanks, Cathy. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. Thank you. Be careful if you go that way. Nice. Thanks, mate. Oh, we're doing well, aren't we? We've, uh, <laughs> let's have a look where we are. Please excuse me with my glasses. Here we go. I think it would be a really good time just to have a glass of water. Let's catch up with Martin Brundle. Well, good evening, everybody. Sorry I can't be with you for the 60th anniversary of the great McLaren team. Doesn't it look magnificent? Everybody at work, the car uh, looks spectacular and how Formula One has developed. I'm so proud to be able to call myself a former McLaren Formula One driver. It was short and sweet. I actually signed up on the Tuesday of the first uh, Grand Prix week when we went off to Brazil. Nearly died when Jos Verstappen landed on my head in the race when the Peugeot engine blew up, which uh, those of you that uh, were around in those days will know happened quite often. But we did get some good results. Second place in Monaco. How wonderful was that? So. Uh, on the podium for McLaren, couldn't be prouder. And I really hope you're having a great evening and, and celebrating what this team has achieved, what you've all achieved with it and for it. And well, cheers. Have a good one. Well, we're going to have time to go to the bar. We're actually ahead of, a little bit ahead of schedule, which is lovely. Um, we were forecasting a very late night, but it probably will be for some of us anyway. Um, our next guest, ladies and gentlemen, um, December the 1st this year marks his 60th year in Formula One, which is pretty impressive if you think about it. The background and his accolades are too many to mention, but I am going to mention a few. It's very important. And he's going to kill me for doing this, because I said I wouldn't do it on the phone. He's a consultant to Bonham's Auction House. He's an advisor to the British National Motor Museum at Bewley. He's a former McLaren International consultant. He's a founding consultant to Speed Vision TV in the USA. A founding historical consultant at Goodwood Motorsport, including the festival, the revival meetings. And in between those roles, he's written over 70 books about the racing and automotive industry as if his personal contacts, his personal knowledge and his range of books are not enough. He now also has an automotive and photographic library of 1.9 million images. So if you're stuck for a photograph of a racing car, this is your man to go to. In November 2022, the Royal Automobile uh, Club in London, excuse me, uh, their Motoring Book of the Year panel presented him with a Lifetime Achievement Award. And here, to give us his views on the wonders of McLaren. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the absolutely wonderful and probably the greatest motoring historian that we have. Ladies and gentlemen, Doug Nye. <laughs> Doug, good evening. Good evening. I said I wouldn't say a lot about you. Get your back later. <laughs> Allow me to give you that. Tell us about McLaren, with your knowledge. With my knowledge, good Lord. Um, I, I was a fan, basically. I'm not part of the family. I'm really here to um, represent the fans on the other side of the fence. <laughs> and uh, I was six years old when I first got interested in racing. And um, it's stayed that way ever since. And one of my um, early loves was um, Cooper with Jack Brabham and this young kid from New Zealand called Bruce McLaren. And uh, subsequently, I was studying supposedly for A-levels at school and I thought, stuff that for a game of soldiers. <laughs> I, I, I'd rather get involved in the racing world. And um, I wrote to Autosport and told them that I perched on the loo every week and memorised the magazine from cover to cover. <laughs> and would they give me a job? And Gregor Grant there said, no, we won't. Um, but he pointed me at Motor Racing magazine that was the... Um, the club journal of the British Racing and Sports Car Club based at Brands Hatch. 
And um, I wrote to them, and they said, well, come and see us. And lo and behold, um, I ended up working for Motor Racing magazine at the start of, well, the end of 63. And then into 64, um, one of my great heroes, Bruce McLaren, um, was doing rather well with um, a, a, a sports car, the Cooper Zerex that had belonged to Roger Penske in America. And he put, um, with Howden's help, <laughs> and Wally Wilmot, and these other wonderful people, um, they put in an Oldsmobile engine. And um, many years later, well, three years ago, I was one of the people who was instrumental in finding, well, bringing it back from Venezuela. And we're restoring the car right now um, to its original order, as it was at the 64 Goodwood TT. And um, one of my earliest memories, really, is of being there as a sort of spotty but should still be at school, cub reporter, you know, all, all covered in ink and school pudding still, and um, standing amongst the photographers beside the start line at Goodwood for the tourist trophy. And in front of me was Bruce in that Cooper on pole position. And beyond him was Jimmy Clark in the Lotus 30. And beyond him was Graham Hill. And so, you know, I was like a pig in the proverbial, you can imagine. <laughs> and uh, I've always been super impressed by what um, guys and girls like yourselves do within the racing world. Just working 24 seven with that sort of dedication and commitment and that level of sustained interest. And honestly, you know, I just salute you all. I think it's absolutely brilliant. And you're all very special people and you should be immensely proud of yourselves. Doug, thank you. Thank you. Perfect. I don't think Doug can add much more to that, ladies and gentlemen. I think that's a great tribute. Would you like to? Yes, I think you should actually. I would, because obviously you said to me when you were 18 and you got your first badge and there you went, do you, rem do you remember your first chats, interviews with the drivers of that time? What were they like? Well, I, I, I vividly remember, because um, I was terribly shy anyway, and I wouldn't talk to anybody unless I'd been introduced, which made me a useless race reporter. Because <laughs> I, I, I'd go away to a race meeting and then come back after the, after the weekend, not having summed up the courage to talk to anybody. Um, but but I, I remember going up to Graham Hill when I saw him in the Goodwood paddock, and there was a free moment, and I said, oh, excuse me, Mr Hill, and he turned to me and he said, bugger off. And the balancing factor to that was somebody like Bruce. And I said to him, excuse me, Mr. McLaren, I'm from Motor Racing magazine. Um, can I introduce myself? And he said, sure, I'll introduce myself first. My name's Bruce McLaren and I drive race cars. Wow. And I thought... He's a proper chap. And then, <laughs> and then subsequently, I remember interviewing him in, in the works at Colnbrook. And um, he sat me down opposite him at his desk. And he was sitting against a window that was, was facing straight out into the sun. And the sun was beating through this straight into my eyes. And there were other people that I'd interviewed who would have just enjoyed having a member of the press, you know, the ghastly press, um, interviewing them like that with the sun beating into their eyes, and they just have left me there. But Bruce said, um, why don't you move around the side of the desk, Doug? He said, the sun's in your eyes. And that's the way it started. Mm. And then talking to him subsequently about Can-Am racing, and he was talking about his, um, his time uh, racing, I think, yeah, it was, at Elk Heart Lake in America. And he was saying late in the race there, and it was one that he won in one of his Can-Am championship years, 
he said, um, you know, the car was going well, the beautiful surroundings, and my mind drifted, he said. And I thought, well, crikey, you know, he's a great driver who had time for his mind to drift. And he was leading the race, but he said it took him way back to his boyhood years driving his Austin 7, his first little Austin 7 that, 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 that you still have today, um, in uh, New Zealand. And he said it was just wonderful and I could just relax and enjoy the rest of the race. And I thought, wow, you know, what an extraordinary thing to, to, to admit to, actually. Um, but, but so dominant was McLaren then that Bruce himself was able to do that. And I just thought that was a remarkable thing. Um, and then subsequently, uh, I remember the launch of the M16 at, at, at Colnbrook again, on that little football ground just at the end of the road there. And the, the, the wheeled the first M16 IndyCar out, which was just the most beautiful thing that we'd ever seen in that lovely wedge shape and that lovely orange colour. Um, and I was quite good at sketching in those days. Um, I can't remember where I put my sketchbook these days. <laughs> uh, and and um, I was sketching the front suspension of the thing, and I was suddenly aware of somebody standing just by my shoulder. And it was Denny. And Denny was famously grumpy and pretty much off limits, you know, to a press bloke. Um, and I was quite sort of alarmed by his presence. And he looked over my shoulder. And he said, let's have a look at that. And he took it from my hand. And he said, yeah. He said, that's all right. And thereafter, Denny was very, very approachable to me. Mm. Um, and that kind of thing just sticks in your mind. And there's one other thing, one last thing. One of the photos in our collection is in the pit lane at Monza in 72 or 73, 73, I think. Um, and the McLarens are parked in the, in the pit there in Eshel. And um, Pete Revson is sitting on the front wheel, leaning back with his legs crossed and his hands round his, his, hands round his knee. Um, and Denny is lying flat on his back within the wheelbase of the car with his shoulders back against the back wheel and his eyes closed. And on the other side of the car, obviously not really able to see Denny properly, was Teddy Meyer. And Teddy has got his arms wide like this and he's holding forth. And it's plain that neither driver is paying him the blindest bit of notice. <laughs> <laughs> but again, that just struck me as typical of the time, typical of the 70s, and typical of the family that's McLaren. Doug, thank you, Doug. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, we're moving towards the close of this evening. Uh, but there's a couple of real highlights, of, as if we haven't had enough this evening, that we really must, excuse me, just moving this over, that we really must do. Um, Matthew, where are you? Come back up, if you would, please. You're like a yo-yo this evening. Well done, that man. It now gives Matthew and I enormous pleasure to introduce you to two women whose name conjures up some amazing memories and emotions on the global motorsport stage and indeed here within McLaren. To this very day, Ayrton Senna's name is still held in awe. People talk endlessly of his skills. Earlier on this evening, I was very fortunate to spend some time with Bianca and we were just going through you know, my own feelings about those times with Ayrton. He had the most incredible focus, as you all know, and his personality, if he walked in a room, he held a room like nobody else I, I've ever met. He stunned the world with his achievements in winning six Monaco Grand Prix, indeed five of them consecutively, which I'm sure all of you in this room will remember around the twisting seats of Monaco, streets of Monaco. Um, we certainly, all of us that experienced it too, can't remember the right, can't forget the rivalry either between the two of them in the 88 season and that amazing pole position at Monte Carlo. I do remember Joe Ramirez standing when we had those little Olivetti timing screens, actually banging the top of the screen when Ayrton put that time in to see whether or not the Olivetti monitor was actually playing up. 
He was really that good, and I know Joe has talked about that on, on video since. His skills were shown time and time again. When we saw him wheel to wheel with Nigel Mansell, 91 Barcelona, who was going to bottle out first? You know, I mean, remarkable scenes of racing. But the important thing is, and I think all of us know this in this room, as a racing driver, he was an inspirational human being. You know, millions of people to this day in Brazil, courtesy of what the family are doing, still follow him and revere him. You only see that. You go to Interlagos, it's a different experience completely. Ayrton will always be remembered very, very fondly as a member of the McLaren family. His legacy lives on through the Instituto Ayrton Center, the Ayrton Center Institute, and thanks to the efforts of his own dedicated family. Vivian Senna's youngest daughter, Paola, uh, is a talented sculptor, and uh, she was honored to be asked by Ayrton's mother to actually produce a bust of him. Can you imagine the pressure of that? I would like you to do a bust of my son, who is known and revered throughout the world of motor racing. Today, a very large version of that bust sits in the Interlagos circuit in Sao Paulo. You'd have seen it at the weekend. It overlooks the, the, the pit lane, and it brings enormous uh, emotion to people. Excuse me. Um, what we'd like to do is show you a short video of Paolo's works. Absolutely fantastic. Gentlemen, video, please. Yes, just due to commitments in Brazil and despite Paola wishing to be with us this evening, um, she really, really was very disappointed not being able to get here. But obviously, with the Brazilian Grand Prix and other things going on, it's meant that she's back in Brazil looking after family issues there. However, ladies and gentlemen, it's with enormous respect and great pleasure that uh, we introduce to the stage none other than Ayrton's sister, Viviane, who is president of the Institute, and her eldest daughter, Bianca, who's CEO of Senna Brands. Bianca is kindly going to translate. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Vivian and Bianca. Vivian, my pleasure. 
I know, Bianca, you're just going to uh, translate for uh, Mum, if I can say that. Um, that is an incredible tribute to Ayrton by Paolo, isn't it? How do you, how do you feel about it? How, how does Vivian feel about it? Well, it was my, ma my grandmother's wish to have... Excuse me. Let me give you this. I do apologise. There we are. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So it was my grandmother's wish to see his, uh, her son as she w used to look at him, you know, in real life. I don't know if you know, but uh, my grandma grandmother was the one taking care of all Ayrton's photos and videos and everything since he died. So she used to, you know, look at his, uh, her son every day. Uh, but when you see the bust, when you see the sculpture, then you can see him like, you know, his eyes are something that, you know, just us or most of you that uh, had the chance to, you know, and uh, meet him could see, you know, those eyes, th those beautiful eyes, that mm. energy that he driven in into his high eyes. So uh, it was, you know, my, my grandmother's wish and then it became so beautiful that we decided to make a big one, you know, show in Interlagos where, you know, is one of the places that he loved mm. much. And now she's selling, you know, smaller, smaller sizes of that. Uh, so it's three uh, different editions. One that is like the, uh, similar to the one that you showed here, uh, the, the aluminum version, which is like just 41, one for each race that Ayrton won. Mm. And then another one that is three, uh, 333, which is the, uh, the maximum of Ayrton speed that was, you know, collected in data. Mm -hmm. And another one that is another, uh, 190, no, 1,091, which is uh, the third championship of Ayrton's um, yeah, that he had in Formula One. Also, we've got behind us, of course, this wonderful work by Paul Oz, which Paul can't be with us, unfortunately. He's been taken poorly today, but he dropped that off for us along with Nikki there. But that, as you know, was, was also cast from data, mm -hmm. which I believe was taken from Eau Rouge Spa, I think I'm right in saying. But I've got a couple of questions, and I have written them down. <sighs> McLaren meant something very special to Ayrton, as you and I were talking at the table earlier. He was, a he was a driving force, and people looked up to him in much the same way as Ron, you know, as a team owner and principal at that time. Had, how did, did he talk to you much about his time at McLaren? Did he discuss it much when you were in family times, his feelings about the team? Let me ask her once. Please, yeah. <laughs> That was uh, Ayrton's most important moment of his career, obviously. So when he was eight years old, he was, you know, just beginning to go kart. He wrote uh, in one of his notebooks that he wanted to become a racing driver, a Formula One champion. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously getting to, you know, uh, make his dream come true, and that happened in McLaren was uh, such a special moment for him. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, a major part of his legacy, if we can call it that, is the Institute, which has done remarkable things. I think I'm right in saying, correct me, please, if I'm not, but um, you're the only NGO recognized by UNESCO for the work that you're doing in education. Yes, in education it is. It That's is. a remarkable, remarkable accolade. And how many, uh, I've looked up some statistics, but I'd rather you tell us, how many students and teachers now benefit from the work that the Institute does? So the Institute was um, launched in '94, the mm. same year that Ayrton had, er Ayrton had the accident. And since then, we had already helped more than 35 million children in Brazil. 35 million? Yes, 35 wow. million children in Brazil. We, as a family, had donated more than $500 million uh, to the foundation throughout this period. And part of Ayrton's uh, IP and image also goes to the foundation. So everything that we do uh, in terms of licensing, a part of it goes to the foundation to today. And this is part of, you know, um, 
what we feel it's important because this was Ayrton's dream. He wanted to make sure that, you know, the Brazi Brazilians, the new generations were able to uh, have opportunity as he had to develop himself fully. Mm -hmm. And that's why we chose education as the main source for that. And I don't know if you know, but Brazil, unfortunately, we have uh, a very poor public education and most of the children are in public education. Um, around 90% is in public education. So the way that we work is like by giving solutions to the public educational system to make the children actually learn what they should learn. Yeah. And this yeah. is all because of this, Absolutely. this woman. Absolutely. I have to say, for those of you that have not spent any time on the Institute's website, I hope you'll have a look after this evening, because when you, I, obviously because of this evening, I read up an awful lot, I should have read up on it a very long time ago, but when you hear those numbers and that amount of money that's been raised for those purposes, it is quite a remarkable achievement, and I think it's a very fitting legacy for Ayrton. And when we launched the McLaren Senna, the first car was auctioned in the uh, gala dinner that you, you uh, made uh, in the end of the year. My mother was there. Mm -hmm. I just had a baby, so I couldn't. But anyway. <laughs> uh, and um, we, it, it was raised 1 million and 300 pounds, wow. 3,000 pounds for the foundation in just in that moment. So, you know, we are very grateful for, uh, for McLaren for everything. No, that's nice to know. Thank you very much. I have to ask you one more question, and it's obvious I've been spending far too much time on YouTube. I found a wonderful clip on there of you and Bruno in America. Laguna Seca, maybe? In the McLaren Senna with Bruno driving, with you in the passenger seat. Yeah. Yeah, and? Go on. What was it like? <laughs> well, to be honest, I'm not a very good... Uh, I don't feel very well in cars like when they are very fast, and obviously my brother as brothers. They like to, you know, tease you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he made sure that I, I had the crazy and best time of my life. And then I had to spend another two hours just like lie down, <laughs> <laughs> recovering from it. No, it's a fantastic film. If you haven't seen it, it only lasts about nine minutes. But it's actually all the McLaren owners on the West Coast of America got together. And Bruno and Bianca were in the car. It's really worth a look. It's very entertaining. And Amanda is always with us as well. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's such an honor and such a pleasure to be standing with the family. Uh, I'm sure many of you feel the same way. We're going to invite them back to the stage in a few moments because at the end of this, before we close with the video this evening, we're going to invite all of, the, all of you that have spoken this evening. We're going to invite you back to the stage along with Bianca and Vivienne. We'd like to get a group photograph. Our photographer will be the far side. So if the rest of you could just stay seated, we'll get a group of everyone that's been there. But we have a couple of things to do. We'll invite you back to the stage shortly. But Vivienne, Bianca, thank you so, so much for being with us. It is an absolute well honor. Well done in the event. Congratulations. It, it is like, seriously, we can see that you made everything with a lot of care. So, you know, congratulations and thanks for inviting us. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Vivian, thank you so much. Thank you. Here I am losing my microphone at the most important part of the evening. Please excuse me while I readjust my ear. There we go. Ladies and gents, uh, at the outset of this evening, we expressed our appreciation of the attendance of our guest of honour at this unique event. We're going to not close, we've got a little bit yet to do with that photograph, but this time I'd very much like on behalf of Matthew and myself and all of us in this room to welcome to the stage to say a few words. Ladies and gentlemen, the boss, Ron Dennis.
<laughs> I can't tell you what it would be to take the risk of ad-libbing this evening. If I started to reminisce and tell you about all the detail and moments of my, uh, not just the McLaren sector, but my whole career, you would quickly realize why in the family, when I start to talk, there's a roll of eyes and they say, here goes a monologue. <laughs> so I took the very conscious decision to really try and capture what I felt was appropriate to say to all of you this evening. And uh, unlike uh, Richard, who's done a remarkable job at flipping between notes and ab-living, you know, I'm really not that talented. And in fact, I hate public speaking, but I actually feel I'm with family, which will probably make it a little more emotional. Uh, so I'm going to use, I'm going to read effectively what is written. It is my words. It was about 15 versions of this. <laughs> because I wanted it to sound right and be balanced. And it's absolutely impossible for me to have captured all the names, all the moments, and touch on those uh, things that probably none of you ever realized were important to me. So if you're not in this speech, I apologize. Because <coughs> you can't embrace everything and everybody, especially when you look at the absolute pleasure that uh, my life has given me to date. So uh, when Matthew asked if I would uh, attend as the guest of honor, at an event to mark the 60th anniversary of McLaren. I honestly didn't know how many people would attend. It's a pleasure to be with you tonight and a joy to see so many familiar faces, most of whom I've not had the opportunity to see in uh, recent years. It's been a wonderful surprise to see uh, and meet again Vivian and her daughter Bianca, who have uh, traveled all the way from Miami and from Portugal to be here, uh, with many others traveling from across the world, from USA, New Zealand, and of course, many of you coming from uh, much closer vicinities. From the champions to the unsung heroes, it is great to see each and one of every, all of you today. We're all part of a particularly special era in the history of McLaren. And it's, a very speci it's very special to be able to be here together to mark the diamond anniversary of the team. You'll probably be shocked to hear that in the early part of my journey, I never particularly liked cars. <laughs> <coughs> but what made motor racing so attractive to me was the constant search for perfection, combined with my love of making things. Plus, and you may have noticed, I am fiercely competitive. So in many ways, motor racing was a perfect match. And with the passing of time, I fell in love, not only with the perfection of good design, 
but with the sport and the team that we celebrate here tonight. Having effectively piloted the company for 36 of its 60 years, perhaps I'm best placed to talk about a little about its history. It goes without saying that it's been a privilege to have led McLaren through the period in which we won 158 Grand Prix and 17 World Championships. There's no better time to say that the McLaren story was never about one individual, but some of all the parts that work together. We had great designers, uh, three of the most iconic are here tonight. John Barnard, of course, not just a designer, but actually uh, a pretty close friend. Anyone that worked in the company was a friend. But we were in the trenches. We had to convince people that his idea was a practical and revolutionary way forward. So I was privileged to live his vision, to take his vision, and to push it into reality. My God, was he slow. <laughs> and boy, did he put me right on the limit financially. <laughs> and of course, there was Steve and Adrian who have lived their own careers. It's pretty awesome what Adrian's done. He looks completely knackered most of the time, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but that is, that's a legacy of you know, his commitment to the following his passion. We had some great drivers. In fact, 27 in total over my 36 years. 10 driver world championships. We won with Nicky Lauda, Alan Frost, Ayrton Senna, Lewis Hamilton, and of course, Mick Hakkinen, who's with us this evening. Of course, there were many other drivers who won races in our cars and contributed to the seven constructors' championships that we claimed. And we're pl I'm very pleased that uh, the very first driver that won a race in a composite car is here with us this evening, which is obviously John. And uh, he's a bit of an old woman then, a bit the same now, but actually, <laughs> on his day, he was remarkably quick. <laughs> we enjoyed terrific successes together. We aimed for perfection and ach achieved lofty standards. More than likely born out of my obsessive compulsive style, of course. I'm aware that I had the highest ideals and acute attention to detail and was perhaps hard to please. I'm told it's often induced fear and respect. <laughs> I'm sorry about the fear. It was never my intention to evoke that feeling. But believe me, while I may be hard on others, no one is harder on themselves than I. And I would like to thank, think that it had a positive influence on others, which perhaps was the reason why so often I heard from wives, my God, what have you done to my husband? He's become so neat and tidy at home. <laughs> <laughs> it happens so often. Many of you have asked me this evening, and perhaps others may be wondering what I'm doing now. I'll keep it simple. I still work 24-7. I have my own well-staffed family office, a variety of investments in different areas, from music streaming, pharmaceuticals, fashion, a construction company, a completion center, 
And why have I got that? Because I just love building things. <laughs> <laughs> I've also ramped up my philanthropic activities, and I'm currently in year five of a 14-year program focused on creating a safer world of sport. It's an NGO called Podium Analytics, which is based in London, but it also has uh, its own institute, which is located in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at Oxford University. So please take a look at the website. Uh, it will absolutely start to blossom in the world. Everything you read about concussion, everything you see in the newspapers, that comes from the initial research that we've been doing. I also try and make a difference. I've sort of given my time to the government. I spent a year in the MOD trying to identify what they should spend money on as regards innovation. And currently I sit as a non-executive director on the board of the Department for Science, Innovation and Technology. I sort of share the responsibility of how the, we spend 120 billion a year on science and technology where it should be spent, and what's most likely to yield the best benefit, benefit to the country. I'm still very active and try to look after myself. As far as I know, no bits have fallen off yet. I'm still pretty mobile, so I am busy. And I'm doing the things I want to do. Each activity, each, each activity with my preferred level of, of, of attention to detail, in fact, I've got worse on the detail. You don't want to live with me, I tell you. <laughs> and I am so damn lucky to have Carol in my life. She's so beautiful, wonderful, a great patient partner. And we're in the sort of second decade of our uh, uh, relationship together. She's pretty damn awesome. I have a great, happy home life. I've got a great, loving family, four amazing grandchildren. And would you believe it, two dogs. <laughs> for those of you who know me, the two dogs is an awesome thing for me to have <laughs> in my life. I can't tell you how many times I wash my hands a day now. <laughs> <laughs> but just as I thank you, many of you at the Royal Albert Hall in 2018, I remain thankful to all of you today. We're all part of a very special time and you all combined and contributed to what was just an amazing period for all of us, but also the period in which we shared together at McLaren. I never forget any of you, nor any of those that sadly, sadly passed along the way. Whilst well, I've put a full stop on my McLaren chapter, I'm now on draft eight of my autobiography. <laughs> It'll probably get to about 30, you know, but it's at draft eight. And I have to say, uh, you know, I'm not actually creating it to publish it. I'm creating it because there's nothing written uh, that really relates to my version of the truth. Of course, my truth might not be the truth, but you need your kids and your grandchildren and everything, to understand what it was like to be in this company and what, it to, to did do, what you had to do to achieve success. So I want to raise a glass, not to me, not to Bruce, not to the shareholders, past or present, but to us and what we built together. From the period of 1980 to the 1st of June 2017, it was our time. And it was with our brand values. They were our successes, and nobody can take those victories away. To remind you once more, together we shared 158 Grand Prix wins, 17 World Championships, and for good measure, we won Le Mans at our first attempt. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, could I just ask you to take your seats just for one moment, please? Thank you. If you would, just take your seats. Gentlemen at the back of the room, if you will, just take your seats, please. Shh. Ladies and gents, thank you very much indeed. I know it's approaching witching hour. Gentlemen over there, please, just take your seats, if you will. Thank you. Ladies and gents, shh, thank you, thank you, thank you. There's just a couple of things that we need to do. Firstly, in fact, we'll do it at the end, because if we stop now, I think we'll have uh, a riot on our hands. Ron, thank you for those words and the sentiments with which they come. It's uh, been a real pleasure having you here. Before we close, ladies and gentlemen, it would be remiss of us not to thank a few people who've made this evening possible. Matthew and I are returning. Where are you, Matthew? Come up and join me, please. Come on, Matthew, where are you? I should just say, and this is really sincere, I, we talked about this at the 50th. When Matt first phoned me up and said, Westy, we should do a 60th, I said, you have got to be joking. Right? And he said, no, 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 I think we should do it. And as marketeers always do, you go, yeah, yeah, that's absolutely fine. Yeah, yeah, call me when you're ready. And then a month later, he turned up in like 47 Excel spreadsheets and a plan of how to make it happen. <laughs> and since then, it's been a vision of passion uh, and you know, real friendship. I mean, I've got to say, you may disagree with me, but we only had one little tiny minus <laughs> fat up through it. And it reminded me very much of, you know, the carefree, wrong creative days and JB's sort of conservative approach. But we overcame it without any door slamming, which was the, the most important thing. We would both just like to thank a few people. Um, very quickly, in your, in your event programme that you have on the tables, you'll find details of two very important things. One is the Grand Prix Trust. It does remarkable work in raising funds for people not as fortunate. Many, many employees and people who've been involved with the sport now even extended to their families. The trust will look at those particular issues within people's lives and if they can help financially, morally, support, whatever, they will do so. Also, the launch of the new Tyler James Alexander Trust. Tyler talked about this evening in those pictures. There's a scholarship now, Jane Nottage has been driving it. It's gonna be held with Cranfield University and it's going to offer internships both in the United States of America and the UK to bring on the next generation of engineers, many of whom we've heard from so successfully this evening. Thank you. I have to give an enormous thanks to the people behind the scenes that you never see. Over there in that corner of the room, Guy and Tess Ferguson, they run a UK business called Multimedia Plus. We've worked together all over the world on putting shows together. Their AV crew are here tonight. There's seven of them here. They filmed it. They've captured it. They've rigged the room. This place was a bomb site at 8 o'clock this morning. Guy, Tess, as ever, thank you. <laughs> a gentleman called Mike Manconi. None of you will know him. Fascinating character. He's in the Jaguar and classic car world. He very dutifully sent everyone's badges on Friday. We were so pleased that Royal Mail lost them. That was incredible. And uh, they were reprinted and arrived here at one o'clock today, so hence our badges. Gary Harmon's been going around taking lots of pictures. Thank you, Gary. Appreciate it. And there he is, Gary on the left there. And key close spaces, amazing car storage, car facilities. Shh, ladies and gents, thank you. Amazing car storage facilities for the wonderful Marlboro McLaren Honda MP44 chassis number three, which you all walked past this evening. And very, very quickly, our thanks must go to Zach Brown, Piers Thin, the lovely Kathy OJ, Emma Kapener for her wonderful artwork, which I do hope you've all seen. Paul Oz, who delivered these magnificent 50 kilo statues of our heroes. Also, Keith Holland, thank you for that. And also a special thank you, Dr. Jerome. Where are you? Thank you very, very much, Jerome, for being with us this evening. We, we must also give a, a shout out to the lovely Petter Oatley, who when we said, where do we find a venue for 350 people? There she is. Thank you very much indeed. 
And hiding away over there in the corner is a gentleman, many of you won't know, his name is Patrick Palmer. He's been very helpful in getting the show rigged for today. And thanks go also to Carl Lynch, the hotel manager here, who has been a superstar today. Nothing was too difficult for him and his team, and I thank them, and Nicola Williams, the hotel event manager. Lastly, very importantly, Sue, Matthew, Alex, Matthew's wife, son and daughter, who have put up with enormous, Emily, I'm sorry, who have put up with enormous amounts, it's late at night, folks, <laughs> give, me, give me a break, <laughs> who actually, attention to detail, attention to detail I know, Ron's going Ron's to find me for that, I'll say it again. Lastly and importantly, to Matthew's wife, Sue, to son Alex and daughter Emily, and my own lovely wife, Denise, thank you for supporting the two of us, because quite frankly, we have spent hours on the phone and it's been worth every second of it that it's taken to put it together. Matthew, and from me, a dear friendship which I said at the 50th had developed and now is very special. We do sincerely hope you've enjoyed being with us. I apologise for the late hour, but I trust you'll agree it's been worth it. To you, Ron, as our guest of honour, our distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, from Matthew and from me, Richard West, we wish you a very, very good night, safe onward journeys, and thank you so, so much for being part of this journey. Good night. Mr. Photographer, chop chop. It is, come on, away we go. Let's go. Everybody smile, it can't be that bad. <laughs> and again. Thank you very much, everybody. Cheers, man.